got a full schedule here this morning. I appreciate you all making it out here uh, early to join us. I'm Mark McClellan. I'm the director of the Engelberg Center for Healthcare Reform at the Brookings Institution. I'd like to welcome you to today's discussion on physician leadership in payment reform. Uh, this is a very timely issue. I want to uh, give a particular acknowledgement to Dr. Richard Merkin and the Merkin Family Foundation for their generous support for our efforts at uh, Brookings to bring physician leadership in healthcare reform generally to the forefront. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, Dr. Merkin couldn't be here, but we do have uh, Mark Wagner and Dr. Michael Smith with us today. Uh, we really appreciate your joining us and, again, the foundation support. Um, I'm going to begin with a little bit of an overview of some of the issues in physician payment reform as, uh, as we see them right now. Uh, then we've got uh, a packed agenda, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I would uh, like to give you a, uh, give an early welcome as well to the people who will be watching online uh, for this event. Um, we do think that the ideas that we're discussing here are going to be relevant to this very important uh, policy debate about physician payment reform that's coming in the weeks ahead. Well, uh, today in payment reform, I think one thing is for certain. We need more clinician leadership. Uh, there are significant changes coming in healthcare delivery and significant changes required in healthcare reform to support that. Uh, one of the most important things I think that's a driver for reform is the fact that if you look at who people trust, who the American public trusts on healthcare reform, uh, above all others, it's their health professionals, the doctors, the nurses, the other clinicians who they know and trust with their lives and the lives of their loved ones. Uh, that reason alone uh, is a, a critical foundation for clinician leadership in, in leading healthcare uh, reform. But on top of that, as I think you'll hear about today, uh, there are countless examples in our healthcare system where uh, there are good ideas coming from clinicians about how to deliver better care and do it at a lower cost where our current policies don't provide the kind of support that they could and should uh, to get to a high-performing healthcare system, one where we're avoiding unnecessary costs. So uh, when it comes to finding ways to identify, develop, and implement the policy changes needed to get us to better care uh, in our healthcare system and thereby uh, to avoid unnecessary healthcare costs, there really is no alternative to clinician leadership and that uh, path forward is what we want to focus on today. Uh, for a little bit of context, I'll, I want to show a couple of slides here in the room for uh, uh, that I think uh, many of you from uh, the congressional staff side will be familiar with, um, and that includes the, uh, um, uh, the focus on updates for physicians that have occurred under the uh, so-called sustain sustainable growth rate formula. Uh, even with a whole series of policy interventions year after year since 2001, the payment rates for physicians under the Medicare fee schedule have uh, not kept pace uh, even with inflation. Uh, this chart shows uh, what the, the numbers for um, payment rate increases would have to be for physicians in order to keep uh, up with the so-called Medicare Economic Index, which is used as the basis for payment updates for most of Medicare's uh, other payment systems. Uh, as you can see from the slide, under the SGR uh, in, uh, uh, throughout the past uh, decade or longer, the um, SGR formula has led to a payment change of negative 5 percent in the early years, now down to uh, negative 25 percent or more. Now, Congress has stepped in, as this chart shows, to provide an actual update, uh, often uh, coming uh, uh, late in the process or even after the, uh, the actual payment year has begun, that has kept the uh, nominal physician fee rates closer to uh, constant levels, so close to zero, as you can see in recent years. But again, uh, that's not even keeping up with uh, inflation. Um, the other uh, uh, new development this year is uh, this slide shows is that uh, we are uh, seeing a, a substantial reduction in the uh, cost of providing a 10-year or for uh, in CBO terms a, a permanent fix uh, to the uh, sustainable growth rate challenge. Uh, this uh, number has come down a lot from $245 billion in August of 2012 to, according to the most recent estimate available from the CBO in February, uh, to uh, um, $138 billion. You can see from this chart that's mainly from a 
a reduced projection in years after 2013. Um, this is a result of some of the slowdowns that have occurred recently uh, in Medicare spending growth. And I think uh, this has led uh, many people to believe that this year may be a better opportunity for addressing uh, physician payment reform than has been the case in the past. Uh, that said, uh, $138 billion is still a very substantial uh, number. Uh, and on top of that, uh, this um, piece of physician payment costs is only a small part of the big challenge in sustainable health care entitlements. Uh, this chart divides federal spending into three parts. Uh, it runs a very long time frame from 1970 and projected forward all the way out to past the retirement of the baby boom in 2040. Uh, we're in kind of the, the middle right of this chart just after that big bump up in federal spending that occurred with the uh, big recession in 2008. And this chart divides federal spending into three major components. There's the, the red uh, component, and that's the health care entitlement programs. That's primarily Medicare, also Medicaid, and the new subsidies for health insurance under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the blue section is Social Security. The green section is everything else that the federal government spends money on, so defense spending and all non-defense discretionary types of spending, including infrastructure, programs for lower-income Americans, uh, research and development, and so on. And what you can see is that the big story, uh, actually for the past several decades, and, and definitely projected forward uh, into the uh, baby boom retirement, is rising uh, share of uh, our nation's economy and rising share of federal spending devoted to the health care entitlement programs. Now, again, physician spending is only a small part of this. That $138 billion change that I was talking about over 10 years uh, would, would uh, be only a small part of the increase in spending that's projected to occur under current law. But it does highlight uh, the, the basic point that we want to come back to today, which is what happens with physician spending while a small part of total Medicare and health care expenditures can be very important uh, in uh, affecting the overall trends uh, in health care spending uh, in our federal programs and more generally. And that brings me to what I think should be the, the real focus of, uh, of health care reform efforts, and that's opportunities to get better care. Um, as you will hear about today, and as many of the organizations, the physician organizations represented in this room have, uh, uh, have, uh, have emphasized in, in their work over uh, recent years, and as uh, many other publications and leadership efforts in health care reform around the country have emphasized, and by that I mean real health care reform, really changing and improving the way uh, that care is delivered, there are a lot of opportunities to, to do care better uh, in the United States. Uh, these include a greater emphasis on prevention, identifying problems early or before they happen. Uh, it's increasingly possible with more uh, genomically oriented, oriented uh, uh, medicine, uh, more efficient and effective care for chronic diseases. You'll hear a number of examples of that in cancer and heart disease uh, today using medications more effectively, intervening uh, in a more personalized way with uh, patients, often outside of the traditional healthcare system, at home, using smartphones, uh, uh, things like that. Coordinating care more effectively, different specialists working together uh, to bring the, the right kinds of treatments together for each individual patient. More patient-focused support to help engage patients in uh, staying well and in helping to manage their chronic diseases and prevent complications, and many other steps. And what you'll here uh, is that in most of these cases, in fact, most of those examples I just described, our current fee-for-service payment systems provide little support, and in some cases no support, for these kinds of effective efforts undertaken by clinician leaders to improve the way that diseases are treated, to improve the way that we uh, can address health problems in the United States. This kind of health care reform cannot be done from Washington. Uh, it has to be done by clinical leaders around the country coming up with good ideas and having the, the stamina, the uh, effectiveness to implement them effectively uh, in our health care system. But what policymakers can do uh, is make it easier 
uh, for clinicians to undertake this kind of leadership. So uh, this is the convergence that we have now. The, the pressures on uh, uh, spending, as I described earlier, the need to address the, the current uh, SGR problem for physicians uh, that's led to chronic underpayment under the current fee-for-service system, uh, the need for innovation in the way that healthcare works with lots of good ideas out there but some struggles and challenges in actually getting uh, these good ideas implemented under the way that current fee-for-service payments work. Um, the uh, need for uh, a real focus on finding ways to solve these problems. And one of the big challenges with, uh, uh, I think, uh, physician leadership and healthcare reform has been that so much effort over the years has had to be devoted to finding a way to do yet another short-term fix in physician payment, just to get payment rates uh, uh, close to a zero change for the next year, that we haven't really been able to put the kind of attention that we need on these more significant uh, reforms that would really enable a, a lot more clinician leadership. And, and these are the reasons that we're here today, is to, uh, to tar start to change that. So uh, real health care reform begins with uh, identifying ways to uh, improve care. Uh, it doesn't necessarily identify, uh, be, begin with ways of uh, just looking at payment uh, uh, changes. What are the practical opportunities for, do it? What practice for doing it? What practices need to change? How can we provide better support for patients, uh, uh, better management of conditions, better coordination of care, some of those ideas that I talked about before? Starting with that, then asking the question of how does Medicare payment need to change in order to provide better support for clinicians to improve care, uh, and then as we implement these reforms, how can we develop the evidence to show that they are having their intended effects, first and foremost on improving quality, uh, but in addition uh, on, uh, as a result of that, reducing overall uh, health care costs. Um, the basic idea here is, uh, is illustrated in this chart. Uh, if you think about the spending that we have on health care in Medicare and really in all of our health care financing systems, only a small fraction of it uh, represented here at the, in the blue at the bottom of the chart goes to clinicians. Most of it goes to healthcare services, to healthcare uh, institutions, uh, drugs, devices, uh, uh, other types of products that are used in healthcare. And uh, as we've talked about before, there is a lot of that spending that's inefficient that uh, could be avoided uh, if the kinds of steps to improve clinical care were implemented more widely, if the kinds of steps that clinicians have led on identifying were implemented more widely. So if you think about a payment reform to address this, uh, it might involve moving some of the payments, at least, that are in fee-for-service now uh, into systems that provide better and more direct support for care coordination, uh, for getting the right combinations of prevention-oriented treatments to, to each patient. And through those steps, we can reduce overall health care costs, providing a better way to sustain uh, physician payment, drive needed reforms uh, that, that clinicians would like to lead in health care delivery, and avoiding increases in health care costs uh, all at the same time. I'm not going to go through these examples because you'll hear about these ideas in more detail from our panelists, but there are lots of examples uh, uh, in cancer care, ways that uh, uh, are not well supported now under fee-for-service, that uh, oncologists, in some cases working with radiologists, surgeons, and other specialists uh, can uh, deliver care more effectively, prevent costly complications. The same thing is the case in uh, cardiac care and cardiovascular surgery, where we actually have some uh, good evidence on initiatives uh, 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 like this. Um, so uh, uh, today we're going to get right into uh, discussing these issues. Um, I do want to emphasize that this is part of our uh, Richard Merkin Initiative on Clinical Leadership at Brookings, which uh, uh, has, uh, fo is focusing on the need for clinicians to develop this full range of skills, not only expertise and uh, experience uh, clinically, uh, but an ability to identify and contribute to opportunities to improve healthcare policies that will make it easier, uh, we hope, uh, for them to use those skills effectively. Uh, and uh, we're right now at the point where we're going to hear from some leaders in Congress on, on this issue. We'll hear first from Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, uh, then from Representatives uh, Cassidy and Schwartz. Uh, then we're going to go into our two panel discussions uh, with physician leaders uh, uh, on identifying and, uh, and uh, identifying ways to improve care and, and take steps forward in uh, physician payment as a result. Uh, and then we'll close out. So uh, a lot of ground to cover today. And without uh, uh, further delay, I'd like to get right to our, our discussion with uh, uh, Senator Whitehouse. Uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse is currently uh, 
uh, uh, in uh, the Senate representing Rhode Island. Uh, before being elected to the Senate, he served as Rhode Island's Attorney General and as U.S. Attorney. He's been a leader in the effort to expand the use of information technology in healthcare to lower costs and improving the quality of care. Uh, he helped Rhode Island in his days there become a national leader in the development and implementation of health IT. He's also served as a policy advisor and counsel to the Governor of Rhode Island as the, and as the state's director of business regulation before uh, he was nominated by President Clinton to become Rhode Island's U.S. Attorney, so a lot of experience uh, in the uh, business sector uh, as well. And here in Congress, uh, among other committees, he's on the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, which works on a lot of these issues related to improving uh, quality of care. Uh, Dr. I'm sorry, no, <laughs> Senator Whitehouse, uh, so you're, you're with uh, practically, I uh, like all the other clinicians here, we're very happy to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. I'm not a doctor, and I don't even play one on TV. But it's good to be over here in what appears to be the Rhode Island room with all these great New England pictures on the wall. And I want to uh, thank the Engelberg Center for hosting this. I want to thank Mark for his many years of leadership, both at CMS and afterwards. He's been a consistently valuable and thoughtful policy voice, even at times when policy voices were being kind of drowned out by more hectoring discussions, and uh, I appreciate that, and I want to particularly recognize Representative Allison Schwartz, who is here and who is your panelist. I'm basically the person who's here between you and Allison Schwartz, so I'll try not to take too long, because she is doing really wonderful work in the House on payment reform, but I, I did want to be here, and I'm very glad to be here. Um, this is an especially important topic, and it's sort of highlighted that today is the day when the President's going to release his budget to Congress, and that's going to create considerable discussion about our budget, and a part of that is the old familiar refrain that if we're going to do something about Medicare and Medicaid, uh, and we have to, uh, what we have to do is to cut Medicare and Medicaid benefits, and that is just plain factually wrong, but it has become part of the um, debate, I guess you'd say. The fact of the matter is that we have a grotesquely inefficient health care system in America. We burn about 18 percent of our GDP providing health care to our people. The second most inefficient industrialized country in the world burns only 12 percent. So we have the record of being 50 percent more inefficient than the least inefficient industrialized competitor we face around the planet. As the country known for innovation and ingenuity, that's not a really great place to be. The uh, President's Council of Economic Advisors uh, and former Bush Treasury Secretary O'Neill, among others, have made calculations of what that gap means if we could fix it. And the estimates range between $700 billion and a trillion dollars a year, not in the 10-year budget periods we're often talking about, but per year. And the most recent number was the IOM's $750 million a year. Uh, and of course, we can achieve those savings without degrading the quality of care. Indeed, the Dartmouth Atlas and other studies suggest that lower cost and higher quality care are associated, and that has certainly been our experience uh, in Rhode Island. The discussions about payment reform, which is probably the single most powerful engine to drive this change that we have, uh, that plus a strong and robust IT base to operate off of, uh, it's been mostly based on the payers, whether it's Blue Cross or United or Medicare or Medicaid, and that is an understandable bias. Insurers are big. Insurers are organized. The money flows through them, and they have a lot at stake. But I think it's a mistake to think we will get the very best policy outcomes by deferring to the judgment of the payers. When we talk about payment reform, it's a conversation not just about how doctors get paid, it's about driving that change through the health care delivery system uh, in a way that protects the hard-earned benefits of our seniors and disabled citizens. 
Uh, shifting away from pure fee-for-service is obviously not going to be easy. Uh, payment reforms like those in the Affordable Care Act uh, will ask physicians to do more, to be more creative, to bill in different ways, and they will ask physicians to take more risk uh, to their own bottom line. But more and more physicians across the country I see recognizing that the status quo in our health care system is unsustainable and they have to get ahead of this problem and that they want to be a part of the debate uh, and that they welcome the challenge of what is called accountable care. An example in Rhode Island is Coastal Medical. It's led by Al Kuros, who is a very enterprising and hardworking uh, guy and a friend. Um, Coastal is a pretty big operation, at least by Rhode Island standards. It provides primary care to about one out of every ten Rhode Islanders. So in our market, they're, they're a big deal. And they are really out changing the landscape of health care. They've been a leader in payment and delivery system reform, an early adopter of electronic medical records, a founding member of the Chronic Care Sustainability Initiative, which is Rhode Island's all-payer, patient-centered medical home model. Dr. Kuros and his team sought to align incentives across public and private payers through shared savings contracts. For Medicare patients, Coastal participates in the Medicare Shared Savings Program. Uh, it has its first shared savings contract on the commercial side, a collaboration with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Rhode Island, which went live on January 1st of 2012. And the other major payer in Rhode Island is United Healthcare, and Coastal just announced a new ACO arrangement with United Healthcare this past March. So, what do Coastal's patients experience from all of this? They experience access to primary care 365 days a year. They experience coordination of services by a nurse care manager. They experience one-on-one -on -one guidance from clinical pharmacists in managing medications after they've been prescribed. They experience an online patient portal to get questions answered quickly, check lab results, and request appointments. They experience real-time alerts that are sent to coastal doctors whenever they are admitted into the hospital. All of that adds up to convenient and high-quality and patient-centered care. So I think there's a lot to learn from Coastal Medical's experience, and I'd like to leave you with what I think are three of the most important lessons. The first is a simple one. The medical home model really works. The doctors, the staff, the patients, everybody likes it. Um, and the second piece of that is that moving toward medical homes is not enough. It's a part of reigning in out-of-control costs, but it's only a part. Second, data. Data is king. As Dr. Kuro said last year during a health committee hearing that I chaired, continuing the work of transforming care delivery and advancing Coastal's capability to manage the care of populations will require more sophisticated use of clinical utilization and cost data and new types of interventions based on what that data can tell us. Achieving the goals of accountable care requires investment in infrastructure and personnel to make sense of data collected through electronic medical records and through information, payment information usually provided by insurers. Under the old system, doctors are often left in the dark about what happens to their patients when they walk out the door. Coastal, on the other hand, is integrating claims data from all payers with information from electronic medical records to give them a more complete picture of what's going on with their parent patients, what services they receive, and what the costs are, the true costs of different types of treatment. New infrastructure and IT capabilities, of course, require new personnel with some non-traditional skills. In the last 18 months, Coastal has hired a director of analytics, a director of practice transformation, and a nurse care manager supervisor. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Rhode Island have paid for a part-time data analyst at Coastal to help put the data to use in planning more cost-effective courses of treatment. So there's a good allegiance there. So medical homes work, data is king, and finally, 
payment reform should be dynamic. Those who work in health care know that there are not very many smoking guns when it comes to wasteful spending. Excess spending is spread over many, many categories, and bringing down overall costs requires a variety of payment and delivery system reforms, often at the same time. Dr. Kuros has said this can often be, quote, a complex process that often entails trial and error. Uh, here at the CBO, Doug Elmendorf has said, many of the specific changes that might ultimately prove most important cannot be foreseen today and could be developed only over time through experimentation and learning. So we have to be open to trial and error. We have to be open to experimentation and learning. Doctors need to clearly communicate what's working and what's not working, not just among themselves and their colleagues, but to government so that we can uh, learn. We want and need to hear those details. So I'll conclude by saying that payment reform done right will move us from volume to value. It will support infrastructure improvements. It will enable a business model geared toward improving the health of entire populations, not just treating individuals. And ultimately, it will make health care more efficient and less costly, generating huge savings and lowering the cost to all of us of programs like Medicare and Medicaid. To make it work, we need leaders from the health community, from Mark McClellan to Al Kuros, uh, to take on the challenge. And I thank you for allowing me to participate in this discussion. Mark. Thanks, Senator, and uh, the Senator's uh, agreed to stay for maybe a, a couple of minutes sure. of questions, uh, if you can. And just to, to start out, you uh, identified in your remarks three big lessons that you've seen in your work in this area. You did a report uh, this past year on healthcare delivery transformation. I was wondering if I could just push you a little bit on the implications for clinicians. So uh, for physicians who are in practice, physicians who are represented by some of the organizations here today, any advice for them specifically on how to move this reform process forward here, how to help move this reform process forward here in Congress? That's a, um, boy, there's a handful of a question. Um, I think the first thing is that you really, 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 really want to be part of this discussion if you're a clinician. And you want the organizations that rep represent you to be a part of this discussion. Uh, this is a discussion that's going to happen with you or without you. You not being there doesn't stop it. You not being there just makes it a less educated discussion. So you really need to be there and to be participating to make sure that the organizations that represent you are. My personal experience is that there have been a lot of uh, organizations that represent clinicians that over the years have become rather parochial about the particular billing interests of particular specialties and subspecialties. And while that is a purpose that I think they do not need to ignore, I think if that's all they're doing, then you are not being well served by those organizations because they're not at that point engaged in the larger discussion. And as I said, the larger discussion is happening anyway. The second point I'd make is don't be discouraged by some of the stuff that's happening in Washington that just is bone stupid. Because there is a, a continuing and I think very useful discussion that Mark is a significant participant in, but many other organizations are participating in. Allison is participating in it on the House side along with many others. There's some of us in the Senate who are participating in it. And it is, a, I think, a very thoughtful discussion. Um, we just had uh, Dr. Blumenthal, uh, Dr. Emanuel, and Dr. Weinstein all were to present to the Democratic senators, and it was a pretty darn thoughtful and, and high-level conversation. Um, and then you get into the public debate, and people are jumping up and down and yelling about death panels, which never existed, and the whole, uh, you know, discussion is, well, as I said, bone stupid. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a more sophisticated discussion going on. And at some point, that's going to become the discussion. It's going to pop to the surface. So you want to be a part of that discussion, even if you uh, scorn and are turned off by the shouting and the sort of bone stupid remarks. So participate. Participate. Um, we do have a microphone here. If there are any questions from the audience, uh, uh, any questions, comments, just uh, identify who you are. 
And please use the microphones that people who are on the, on the web can hear. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Jonathan Block. I'm with Modern Healthcare. Uh, I understand that in the House there's a couple of committees that are working on legislation that would repeal the sustainable growth rate. Uh, I'm curious to know what's been going on with that in the Senate. I think the discussion is more advanced in the House and you'll hear uh, a lot more about it from Allison who is uh, one of if not the uh, leader of that discussion. Um, I think it's pretty clear that something's got to change. Um, the Senate is quite committee based on this and um, the, I think the person who could probably best answer that question for you is the uh, chairman of the finance committee. Um, but there are a number of us who are continuing to kind of flesh out ideas and try to figure out what the next step is and try to figure out what is important in Washington, but really not so much anyplace else, which is what the quote pay for is um, kind of a phantom pay for because we end up adjusting what the medical profession is paid every year anyway, but each year we have to pretend that we're not going to, and if you're going to change it, you then have to come up with a pay for instead of doing it annually on an emergency basis without a pay for, which has been our habit for decades. So. That phantom quality, I think, is uh, a little bit of an inhibitor for the discussion. But as I said earlier, there are some pretty high-level, thoughtful discussions that are taking place um, at the Senate level that need to, I think, percolate up through that Finance Committee in order to come to fruition. All right. Any other questions? I have a follow-up. If there's not, we have time for maybe one more. Um, so just uh, to pick up on that is those uh, more sophisticated discussions you're saying are taking place. Uh, how well do you think those are fitting in with the themes that you raised about moving away from fee-for-service, about doing more to focus on supporting clinicians deliver, delivering high-quality care in many innovative ways? What I see happening is that um, the folks who are out there actually delivering health care uh, are starting to really move into commitment to the kind of delivery system reforms that we have been talking about. And it's all the way across the country from, you know, Kaiser on the Pacific Coast to Intermountain in the Rockies to Gunderson Lutheran up in the north and the Palmettos down in the south and Mayo and uh, Geisinger, more towards Rhode Island, and of course we have a whole multi-party statewide initiative going in Rhode Island, people are really bought into it. And they're seeing the results in real life in their practices, if they're Alcuros, in their hospitals, if they're Geisinger, in their insurance products, if they're Kaiser. And I think um, it's now, for a while it had the feeling of a movement. I think it's now a little bit more established than a movement. It's now a business model. And it's not a perfected business model, but it's one that an enormous amount of effort is going into. And I think that it's gotten to the point where we're not just saying, why don't you do this from Washington? Now we're starting to, say, to have the input come back to us. And the input is, how are you doing it? And over and over again, people are doing it. And common themes are emerging. I'll close. The example that I use on this is the early days of aviation. There came a time pretty early on when we'd figured out that if you spun an air screw fast enough, it generated propulsion. And if you curved a wing, it generated lift. And if you twisted the ends, you could steer the thing. But anybody who looks at the early exploratory devices in the early days of aviation knows it was pretty inelegant at the beginning. And a lot of materials hadn't been developed that were necessary for where we are right now. But we moved pretty quickly from what looked like a kite being buffeted on the winds of Kitty Hawk to big high-tech aircraft cruising down tunnels of uh, information support to land safely at a couple hundred miles an hour while people sip tea and watch movies inside out at Dulles Airport. The principles didn't change. We got better at implementing them. I think we figured out what the principles are now of delivery system reform, payment reform, HIT, primary care and prevention. We've got kind of 
some of those basics pinned down, and now it's a question of learning how to implement them and developing the new technologies that will support them. And um, so we're not, we maybe still be flying biplanes a little bit, but I think there's a really bright future for this, and I think the principles are established and the business model is now starting to work. Thank, thank you very much, Senator. We appreciate your joining us thank this morning. You. Great. Great to see you. Thank you, everybody. All right, we're going to move to our discussion from some of the leaders in the House on, uh, on physician payment reform. Uh, very pleased to have with us today uh, Representative Bill Cassidy, Dr. Cassidy, thanks for, for joining us from Louisiana. Representative Allison Schwartz, yeah, I think if you go on the same, this is, our, this is, uh, this is one of those issues where uh, I think everybody is on the, uh, on the same side broadly. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, Representative Schwartz is currently serving her fifth, fifth term representing Pennsylvania's 13th Congressional District. She serves on two major committees in Congress, the Budget Committee and the Ways and Means Committee, which uh, have jurisdiction over the issues that we're talking about today. As a leader on health care policy for many years, really throughout her career, Representative Schwartz has played a significant role in addressing issues in primary care and improving access to uh, affordable coverage, ensuring coverage for children with pre-existing conditions, uh, working on uh, other issues related to seniors in the Medicare program. Most recently, she's taken the lead on reforming the Medicare physician payment system and has had a, a number of legislative proposals and has been very actively engaged in bringing the, the broader physician community and other stakeholders along uh, with the challenging issues of physician payment reform. She's the founder and co-chair of the Healthcare Innovation Task Force, which brings together healthcare leaders in Congress to advance and promote innovations in the healthcare system. And she's also the founder and co-chair of the Academic Medicine Caucus, where she's been an advocate for academic medical centers and has worked closely with medical schools and teaching hospitals and healthcare organizations, uh, particularly in southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, before her serving in Congress, Representative Schwartz was a leading healthcare executive in Philadelphia, and I think she, she may tell you about some of her other uh, very extensive uh, personal experiences with the, the healthcare system and a family uh, in, involved in healthcare uh, as well. Uh, Dr. Cassidy is a representative from Louisiana, uh, where he has been an associate professor of medicine with Louisiana State University. Uh, Dr. Cassidy has provided care for uninsured patients. He's taught doctors in training at the Earl Long Hospital in Baton Rouge for over 20 years. Uh, he co-founded the Greater Baton Rouge Community Clinic, which provides free dental and health care to the working uninsured uh, in that area. He also created a public-private partnership to vaccinate 35,000 children in the Greater Baton Rouge area against Hep B at no cost to schools or parents. And in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, he led a group of healthcare volunteers to convert an abandoned Kmart building into an emergency healthcare facility, providing some basic healthcare to hurricane evacuees. I remember working with uh, Dr. Cassidy at that time and uh, getting some CMS support for those uh, extraordinary efforts. Before being elected to serve in Louisiana 6, uh, Representative Cassidy served in the Louisiana State Senate. In the U.S. House, he is now on the Energy and Commerce Committee, where he serves on the Health Subcommittee as well, so also very involved in uh, physician payment reform efforts here, and he's an assistant whip for the House Republican Conference. Uh, he's uh, also uh, worked on legislation related to health care, as well as energy coast and coastal restoration and other issues. So we're going to hear first from uh, Congresswoman Schwartz, uh, then from Dr. Cassidy, and then we're going to have some discussion back and forth. And so uh, please uh, go ahead. You can stay there if you want or come up, I'm whatever's easy. I'll okay. try and do this quickly and keep it together. Anyway, uh, first, thank you very much to, to Mark and to his leadership role in, uh, in helping make sure this is a bipartisan conversation and in moving that conversation to uh, finding common ground not easy around here, so um, we're really very, very pleased to work with Mark and appreciated his early comments of support for changing the payment system. I think that's ex enormously important uh, and uh, was really helpful uh, to me and I think to, to all of us. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge many of you who represent physician or associations and you heard from uh, Senator Whitehouse that uh, the role you play not only in speaking up for particular issues for your uh, particular specialty, subspecialty, or, or broader group really matters, but your, your involvement in the broader discussion about how we get the best value for our dollars, how we actually make sure that uh, Americans, particularly American seniors, have access to the health care they need and that we can afford to pay for it has been enormously helpful. 
and I think you've moved the dialogue. Having been uh, involved in healthcare policy for a long time, uh, it is really very helpful to uh, have the physician community not just say, leave us alone, no way, no how, but instead move on to say, how can we be not only a part of this discussion, but real leaders in this discussion about improving the uh, quality of care and access to care. So thank you. Um, we're not done yet. We have work to do. So um, what I wanted to um, also say is, uh, following up on some of what Senator Whitehouse said, is I believe strongly that we have moved the debate um, and the actual pr provision of uh, care in different ways, and you've done that. We've pushed it um, from a policy point of view, but the, um, the, the new uh, delivery system reforms have been enormously important. It's important for us to be able to say it actually works what works and what doesn't. I believe that it is a dynamic system. Healthcare is a dynamic system. We have to really um, keep moving that system and learning from it. Medicine is evidence-based. Uh, sometimes we have to move that evidence qu quickly uh, and get change behavior. I guess the one difference I would say with Senator Whitehouse is this is not just technology and then how do we implement it and scale it up. It is really changing behavior of hospitals and physicians and patients. Uh, and it also means changing some of what we do as providers, uh, I mean, and payers, obviously. So uh, that, and that's sometimes harder to do. You can say, here's what you have to do. Getting everybody to do it obviously sometimes takes a little bit more work to do it. And to make sure you're paid for, and physicians in the health sector are paid for, uh, uh, the, uh, and the payment system really incentivizes the right behavior. So which comes first is kind of where we are. Uh, what I did want to say, or how we actually do both at the same time, is really the issue. So um, I think some of the, the delivery system reforms that are working, that we're uh, proud of, that we want to do more of, you've heard about patient-centered medical homes. I was an early advocate of patient-centered medical homes. We're seeing that uh, be implemented across this country in, in different ways, but being implemented and making a difference, access to primary care, uh, actually provision of care for particularly those with serious chronic diseases that help them not get sicker, but help them be healthy uh, and as best they can makes an enormous difference in terms of their lives, but it also in terms of cost saving. Bundle payments, uh, some of the issues around transition of care. Uh, I've talked a lot about independence at home and the whole models of how you actually move beyond the walls of the hospital into people's homes. How do you actually make sure they get the care between um, or maybe avoid hospitalizations? How do you even get physician practices to begin to think more about getting care uh, to people where they need it uh, and avoiding the most costly care. Uh, I'll also say some of the work that's being done on patient safety in hospitals is also producing real cost savings uh, as well as saving lives. All of this is working. How we get it to be done universally, that's kind of one of the things I know we're all working on. Uh, and I will also say that this is a public and private uh, cooperation on this, not just because of the providers, but also because of the private payers. Some of them are actually using very interesting models where we can do all payer. That obviously has an enormous impact, um, but that's extremely important. So uh, I think what, uh, we ought to keep doing all of these delivery system reforms. We ought to scale up the models that work. Uh, we have to really engage uh, to make the standard of care rather than isn't that a nice program over there and doesn't that do an awfully good job? How do we actually do more of what works and save money that way um, and get the best kind of care? So just really quickly, I won't, I don't have to go into all of the details of my proposal, but I will say, and I'll try and say this slowly, I think the way we pay physicians in this country under Medicare has to change. We all know that SGR didn't work. We all agree, we agree on a bipartisan basis that we're not going to ever use the SGR, uh, but repealing SGR permanently is, a, is very important. We have to find a way to uh, pay for it. Of course, we're, the fact that CBO now scores it at $138 billion, while that's still a chunk, chunk of change, even in our world, it is less than we have seen for years and maybe the, less we'll, the least we'll ever see. So we have to get it done, and we ought to get it done this year. We need your help to do that. But I also believe that we can't just leave a hole there. We have to replace it with a payment system that does uh, allow different models of care, that uh, recognizes that physicians should be able to make choices and what kind of model works for them. I uh, don't think there's, there is not one model that works best universally. I think there, it matters geographically. It matters. It could be different styles just for preference. Uh, it may even matter in terms of um, specialty. So, we ought, but we ought to replace it, and we ought to be moving. Uh, towards a system that does uh, incentivize coordinated care, again, a variety of models, uh, but there's also monitor quality and reward uh, both quality and improved health status for your patients and the population you serve. 
Uh, so I'm happy to give the details of that proposal, but what it really does is move us forward in saying there's a transition period of time, five to seven years, uh, where physicians have control of the decisions about what model they embrace, but then in fact we're going to be moving towards this. We can hang on to fee-for-service if in fact it meets quality and cost savings as well. So we're going to do it, right? Um, what's good about this is that I'm a Democrat, as you know, Republicans agree with me. How re remarkable is that? I've had some really good conversations on the Ways and Means Committee uh, with Kevin Brady, with some of the people who are working on this, the details. Uh, we do need to, to get some, um, well, we can talk more about the Senate. We are leading the way in the House, I have to say on this. We really are. Uh, but we do need to make sure that the Senate embraces this. Uh, and uh, while I don't expect my legislation to pass exactly as is, because you, although that'd be fine with me, um, uh, I'd make it's fine with me whether it has my name on it or it doesn't. Um, I want to get this done. Uh, but I do think that we need to finally get it done and move it forward. Uh, it's not going to be the end of the conversation. And I think sometimes we keep thinking it has to be the end all and be all, but it's a really important, essential step if we're going to get health care uh, that we promised our seniors now and into the future. We're going to save money. I want to give, uh, make sure that providers, physicians in particular, have a real say about how that happens. So thank you, and I look forward to your uh, the conversation. I want to acknowledge my colleague and uh, Bill and I worked on this, and I appreciate the ability to work across the aisle to get this done. Thanks very much, Representative Schwartz, for the overview of your proposal and uh, your, your uh, approach to, to trying to get this done this year, as you were saying. Uh, I'd like to turn now to Dr. Cassidy. Yeah, let's acknowledge uh, Allison's role, because at some point people thought it couldn't happen, and then she and Joe, uh, Joe Heck put up something. Uh, we've since subsequently at least floated a proposal around, and now suddenly I think uh, people think they need to get ahead of the train. So hats off. Um, the title of this is Position Leadership and Payment Reform. I would say that there cannot be payment reform unless there is position leadership. I will take a little bit of an exception to what uh, Senator Whitehouse said, although I didn't hear all his remarks, in that he implied that we can set up a system and in some way that is going to channel all these physicians into doing exactly what she or he should do. As a physician who's practicing, I'm not quite sure that is the case. Uh, if, if, um, if being in the House of Representatives, being the Speaker of the House of Representatives is hurting cats, then perhaps uh, hurting physicians is hurting cats on crack cocaine. Uh, I mean, you know, they're, they're very skittish, they're going to take off, and they're very nervous. And I would say, I think it's a principle that unless you put the physician and the patient in a mutually beneficial health, healing, and financial relationship, you will never have effective reform. But if you do, Effective reform is a given. Now, I would judge any proposal placed before us the degree to which that puts those two in that mutually beneficial healing and financial relationship. By the way, I think I can point towards our legislative history to say that at times this has been tacitly acknowledged. It's commonly pointed out that physicians uh, will probably get about 12%. If, the, if this is the pie chart of the healthcare dollar, Physician reimbursement's about 12%, uh, something like that. I'm a little rusty on the exact number. What they prescribe is the balance. Now, SGR kind of acknowledged that. In SGR, it said to the physicians of the world that we expect you to control the cost, and if you don't, we're going to penalize you all. Now, the way SGR was set up, the principle behind it was valid. It is the physician who is writing 88% or 98% of what is of what is spent. But the way it got it wrong is that uh, Physician Smith may be practicing very cost-effective medicine. Physician Jones may be blowing a hole in the bottom of the bucket. Physician Smith is penalized for the blowing the hole in the bottom of the bucket by, by Physician Jones. Clearly not a, uh, a good situation. I compare it to a fraternity. Uh, in a fraternity house, everybody owns it, so no one takes care of it. Uh, if you're going to make everybody own the responsibility, oftentimes there's not an individual that can affect the outcome. On the other hand, if you say, Physician Smith, if you practice cost-effective medicine, then you shall be rewarded. And Physician Jones, if you do not, then you shall be penalized. Then sh Physician Smith, she is going to do a great job. Now, if you combine that with quality indicators so that we know that Physician Smith is not just scrimping upon care, but rather investing where it is appropriate, 
that is where we want to be. Now, by the way, I would say that there's already systems which do so. I'm not speaking of accountable care organizations. They may work, they may not. I will point out that the data is at best equivocal as if these save money. Pretty interesting. We're banking a heck of a lot on something in which demonstration projects specifically picked out for those settings in which they were most likely to succeed showed no net savings when judged across all the sites. That's pretty interesting. On the other hand, I can give you examples of where you're establishing a mutually beneficial healing and financial relationship. Outcomes are better and costs are lower. I always use the example of WellMed. It's a group of physicians in San Antonio, Austin area, in which they're now down to the uh, uh, border with Mexico and they're also in other states. And I always brag on them, at least what I've understood of their business model, they go at 85% risk with the Medicare Advantage program. Okay, so they're taking 85% of what the MA plan does. And then these docs take these patients on board, these Medicare patients, and taking them on board, each physician has only about five or 600 patients in her panel, whereas the typical primary care doc in that region has 2,000 patients on their panel, and they manage the care tightly. Now, they go at, at risk, they go with the MA plan because they can go at two-sided risk. They're going at two-sided risk. They at 85% of what the MA plan is get, getting, and they are improving outcomes judged by decreased readmission rates and other criteria, high patient satisfaction, fewer patients per doc, but the docs are making significantly more money with a lot more job satisfaction. That's nirvana. That really is nirvana. It is where we have better outcomes at lower cost. Physicians are satisfied. They're not retiring at age 55 burned out because they've been treated like a rat in the maze. If we just put the cheese one more place, we'll get them to line up what they want to do with a high rate of patient satisfaction. Now that's a model that actually works. It's not an ACO, it's actually playing off the MA plan, and it's playing off the, again, principle that you need a mutually beneficial healing and financial relationship. The activated patient, if you will, with the activated physician. Now, by the way, DC solutions are almost always big. They always assume that smart people, either in DC, a bureaucracy someplace, a large insurance company, a think tank, are able to come up with better ideas than the individual physician practicing in her community. I will say that most physicians graduated at the top of their class. They, uh, Ube Reinhardt points this out. Ube Reinhardt points out that most physicians graduated ahead of the attorneys, accountants, and bureaucrats that attempt to govern their life. Now, in this battle of wits, we have to say it is at least equal. Granted, there is the coercive power of the state, but the OBGYN can stop delivering babies at age 50 and just go into another line of business so that she can be at home when her daughter comes home from school if you, t if you try and make the restrictions upon her too onerous. I tell you, physicians are retiring at an earlier age because they do feel corralled. We are losing a tremendous amount of people who just feel corralled. That is not the way to do healthcare reform. I will finish up by saying that there are models that work, but in these models there has to be the tools for that physician to do well. So going back to our WellMed model, they have physician data. They can tell you that if the patients that they are receiving who sign up for their product are going to four different places for cancer care, what are the outcomes and quality and cost and patient satisfaction of those four areas? And then they are going to go to those areas that are poorly performing, say, listen, you're above cost, you got lower quality. Bring it in line or else we're not going to send you patients. That way, the physician who can best make the judgment as to whether or not another physician is providing quality care is in the position to do so. I will say never can a guy or a gal in Washington, D.C. understand whether the experience of a patient going to this gastroenterologist or that gastroenterologist is equal. But the primary care doctor who refers to them, who hears their feedback, who understands the quality of their work, can. We need to not think big 
where everything emanates from Washington, D.C., we need to trust those providers in a mutually beneficial healing and financial relationship with their patient to do exactly what is in best interest of both things. That is the way we will go to scale quickly on payment reform. I would go back to the title of this talk, unless there is physician leadership, there will not be payment reform. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you all both for uh, your heartfelt comments on uh, this issue of physician leadership and payment reform. I'd like to start out with a, a couple of questions and we'll open it up to the, the rest of the, the group assembled here today. Um, and let me start with uh, Representative Schwartz. You know, in listening to, to both of you and also to much of what Senator uh, Whitehouse had to say earlier and had similar discussions with Dr. Coburn and others in, uh, in the Senate as well, there seems to be a lot of common ground. So uh, I, I heard uh, uh, recurring themes of uh, recognizing the, the serious frustrations that physicians are facing today in, uh, in their current practice, and it's not just the administrative uh, paperwork associated with fee-for-service, it's the fact that they aren't getting support for the kinds of care that they think their patients uh, uh, need, uh, prevention, coordination, uh, getting people referred to the right places that Dr. Uh, Cassie was just talking about. Second, there's an agreement on uh, uh, payment reforms that provide better support for improving outcomes and, and lowering costs with more uh, accountability and more control for the, the physicians involved in, uh, uh, in guiding that care done, done uh, locally um, and relying on their, their, their best ideas to come up with uh, how to implement uh, re reforms that can make a difference. And on top of that, you all uh, both talked about the need for better tools for physicians uh, to do their job effectively, better data, better support for managing it. Uh, what do you see as the, the, are these the common themes? Where are the, the, the biggest disagreements or challenges in, uh, uh, in moving forward? Uh, well, I think there is a lot of agreement on this, and I think particularly the degree to which we can build in flexibility in the way we actually model this legislation, both in terms of what the models look like and, uh, and what tools would be available in terms of physician choice, I think is really very, very important because we may not be able to work out all the details of whether we actually think physicians always do the right thing or whether they actually sometimes refer patients to their best friend who may not be the best person for them. I, you know, I'm, I happen to have physicians I love. You know, my husband, my son, my daughter-in-law, uh, my six-month-old granddaughter. We're not sure what kind of physician she'll be, but you know, it's um, these are really uh, these are people I really care about and and have a lot of respect for. And I don't think we want to, and we should not get in the way of clinical decisions or the patient-doctor relationship. That's critical uh, for all of us. Uh, but but certainly making sure that our physicians are informed about uh, what works best. And again. Um, you know, if we say, to, I remember hearing a teacher say this, but I think a doctor would say the same thing. I always did it that way. I'm just going to keep doing it. You hear that from some of your members, right? Well, sometimes they have to change the way they've done something. Uh, they want to, I think most physicians want to do that. They are smart. They're, they're scientists. Uh, they want to do this. But getting them to sort of understand and trust the data that's available to them, I think that's enormously important. Do I really trust? If you don't trust the data, then you don't follow the information. But um, having said all that, so I think there's work we can do, and I don't want to pick where we might not agree, but uh, obviously what we have to find agreement on is, and I think we have it. I think there's a lot of what Bill said, a lot of what I've uh, written down in, in terms of uh, language that moves us in this direction, that gives physicians and physician groups and providers the tools to make these choices. So it is not driven completely by uh, Washington. But how we pay physicians in this country makes a big difference, and we ought to use that as a tool to help move us in a direction of greater quality of care and reward those, as Bill said, uh, those physicians who are improving quality and saving, saving costs. Um, so I, how, I think the real question is how do we get this done? I think there's just enormous agreement on this. I, I really do. How do we actually get this done? Again, I've heard from both um, Ways and Means, Energy and Commerce that there's real interest uh, in getting this done, uh, which would just be great because there's going to be a lot of... Uh, disagreements about Medicare more broadly, potentially, but if we can move this dial, which is huge, in the way we pay physicians in this country, I think that really changes uh, and helps inform everything else that we do on, on Medicare, uh, because it takes us away from a conversation both of us don't, I think neither of us want to have, which is how do you actually cut benefits? 
That's not what we want. We want to make sure, and I think Bill would say this as a physician, certainly I would say this as somebody cares about access to care, is we want our seniors to have access to the care they need when they need it, right? And we, we ought to pay for it. So how we actually get that done, how we can actually save on, on the costs that are unnecessary procedures or care or duplication, um, all of that really, there's a lot out there, so let's do it the right way. I, I, we just need a big push, and I, I would say we need a big push from not only the physician community, uh, but also from beneficiaries to say, let's do this, and let's do it right, this is what's going to help us be able to uh, get the care we need and be able to provide the care that we want to. And we know physicians um, are saying that, and you are. So let's keep uh, getting this done. Let's keep talking about that. So we're not just talking about it in December, but actually getting this done. I think what most of us would like to check this off the, the list and move on to some of the other really important debates that we have to have within Medicare and within healthcare more broadly. I agree with all of that, but I would say that there are some significant differences. If you think about it, the ACO is prejudiced towards big because there's only retrospective assignment of patients. And so it's only two years after you're into it that you realize that the patient is really yours and you're going to then get paid two years later. If you're a small businesswoman who happens to have three people in your practice, that's a cash flow issue. You don't get the reward until you're two years out. Now, if we are really going to think seriously about how we allow that small businesswoman who happens to be a pediatrician, I'm not thinking Medicare necessarily, I'm thinking the more broadly, but we can think wherever you want, uh, then we have to say, wait a second, maybe prospective assignment would be better. So MA plans have the advantage that you know who your patients are at the outset, and you got a cash flow savings. Actually, actually that is there's no disagreement on that. I agree with you. Oh, wonderful. She's going to co-sponsor our bill. <laughs> no, but I, I, th I think it is, agreement. you know, we were trying to really be careful about, uh, I think the President wanted to be really careful to say that no one had to change doctors. You didn't have to, we were going to get be sure of that. So, But I agree, it's, it would be much better but for I, both I patients do. and doctors to know we're in this together, and we're going to work together on this, and you could change. Doctors could change. You know, the patients could make changes, but at least you know where you're going. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, and there's ways to work that through on the ACO, but it's a workaround. This administration is prejudiced against MA plans, uh, and so I think that uh, I actually see the MA plan, a hybrid of that between that and the ACO, as perhaps a way to go, one of those models. Yeah, that that so could to to allow it. someone to have prospective assignment without having a workaround. I also think we need to think more clearly how to activate that patient. My, again, thinking of Nirvana, for whatever reason I'm into Nirvana this morning, um, wouldn't it be great if someone could scan a QR code and she could say, wow, my doctor just ordered a CT scan of my abdomen. I can go to this hospital for $2,500 cash payment with my HSA and this one for 250 and by this, the quality indicators are the same, I know where I'm going. Just like my wife makes the decision whether to go to Target, Walmart, or local grocery based upon cost, quality, and convenience. It can happen. There's a billboard in Louisiana, open MRI, $350. It's a billboard. If your doc does an open MRI prescription for you and you've got an HSA, you go there for 350. It doesn't say whether it includes professional fees, so it doesn't quite get to Nirvana. But it, uh, <laughs> but what you didn't see, tell us? <laughs> you see where we're going with that, and that's where I think we need to be. I think more. Probably also agreement on empowering patients through better data as well as. Uh, the, you know, the I am. Um, although I will say that um, you know there are uh, limits to that. Yeah, to some extent, I really uh, am concerned because if your physician says really this is really as you said in your earlier remarks, mm -hmm. this is really the doctor I think you have to go to, and that doctor is twice as much. Do you actually? What do you do? You know, I mean, as patients, we really do trust our doctors, and we actually do like convenience, and we do like what our friends tell us. And, you know, do you actually, or if you actually have chest pain and you're in the ambulance, do you really remember to grab your phone and look up what's the name of that organization that tells us the data and can tell me which hospital is really the right hospital to go to, and can I really redirect the ambulance to do that? The fact is you can't. So what I actually think has been very effective, and Pennsylvania has been a leader in this, by the way, in terms of the Healthcare Cost Containment Council, it's really the hospitals and doctor groups that look at each other's data and says, you know what, I don't really like being number 10. I really want to be number two in quality and cost. And they say, what can I do differently, and what is that hospital or doctor group doing that I'm not doing? And that has been enormously helpful so that the patient can decide this, you know, because actually everyone is performing at that high level and, uh, and at appropriate cost. So I just, I, we have a little difference of opinion about some of that, but of course patients have to be a part of this also. They can't just say, 
and I think doctors are helping with this, that you know, you suggest an MRI, or my friend told me I should get an MRI, and tell me that doctors don't hear it all the time. Or my friend told me that why can't I get it? My insurance covers, covers it. And the doctor has to say, well, you really don't need it. You know, you're really doing fine. We can wait a month, we can wait six months, or you never need it. Or there's some uh, cons negative consequences to having too many tests as well. Uh, so it, we all, it, there's a lot of work to be done to make sure that patients understand their role in this also. As simple as filling the prescription and taking it. Not now, so simple. I'm not sure that we, if I explain my perspective and take empirically where we're coming from, I bet you I can talk Allison into agreeing with me. Um, <laughs> uh, that's why I say it has to be a mutually beneficial relationship between physician and patient. So there's a group out of Washington State, Q Alliance, uh, and in the Q Alliance model, somebody pays a 50 or to $100 monthly prescription, or excuse me, fee. And every month they can go someplace else. Boy, time out, Doc. You made me wait too long in the waiting room last month. I'm out of here. So they are all geared. And so the, 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 the quote the doctor says, Dr. Bliss, what a wonderful name for a physician. Um, Dr. Bliss says, you don't send your patient to your friend because if your friend is more expensive or they have a bad experience, you lose the patient. You send the patient to where she will have the best experience. And their model is entirely based upon being in that mutually beneficial financial healing relationship with the patient. Um, and so it isn't, oh man, my gosh, I play golf with this guy, so I better send him a patient. It's, I gotta keep this patient, and if she leaves me, I'm poor. And maybe she's poor too. Now, that would be number one. Number two, I also think that we have to have data systems. Clearly, you can have a teaser rate. Someone can say, well, listen, I'm going to give you a, a cheap rate on the initial visit, but on the other hand, on the back end, there's a lot of cost. And, and the model that my office is thinking of is that to have a group of neurosurgeons, and they would tell you, okay, somebody has a glioblastoma uh, with these comorbidities, and this is going to be the total cost of a bundle of care. And so you get that total cost of a bundle of care, and that neurosurgery group can market that to an ACO, to an MA plan, to a group of private physicians. The private physician says, okay, that's the bundle of care cost. You can take your QR code, and you can see bundle of care cost neurosurgery group one and two. You can see those quality indicators, and you, the activated patient, can agree with me, the activated physician. Um, uh, again, I know that works. Because if you go back to the well model, well med model, they tell me they will look at the cost of this hemodialysis unit, that, this, and that. And they can look at the bundle of care over a two, three year period of the total cost of management of this patient. Because they are paying for that. It doesn't profit them to send it to a high cost, low quality patient. It profit uh, center, it behooves them to send it to the low cost, high quality. And because their alignment, both healing and financial, is with the patient, the patient goes where she should as opposed to where maybe she should not. This uh, discussion back and forth has been great, and I like the theme of alignment. Um, I know you all have other things that you need to go to, and uh, so I'd like to thank you for thank your you. Thank appearance you. here good. today, good. and uh, we look forward right. to continuing we'll to work with you. All right. Thank you all. all right, help make this happen, all right? Let's get it done. <laughs> great. Um, and uh, with that, I'd like to move right into our, uh, our first panel discussion on specialty and primary physician leadership in payment reform for cancer care. So I'll ask the three of you to come up. We don't have any seating arrangement uh, arranged, but uh, 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 two on one side, one on the other, obviously. And uh, I'll go ahead with the introductions while you all are getting seated. Um, this has been a, a great warm-up to the discussion. I think the, the uh, um, comments that we just heard from uh, Dr. Cassidy, Representative Schwartz, about alignment uh, and about some common ground focused on improving quality and uh, lower costs uh, is a great foundation for this effort, So, uh, as you'll hear from the, the comments coming up. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, Alan Lichter, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Prior to joining ASCO, he was at the University of Michigan, where he served as Chair and Professor of Radiation Oncology and then as Dean of the Medical School. 
prior to his tenure at University of Michigan. He was director of radiation therapy at NCI's radiation oncology branch. Uh, in 2002, uh, Dr. Lichter was elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Science. Uh, he's been a leader in ASCO for uh, more than 30 years, uh, including uh, serving as president and founding chairman of ASCO's Conquer Cancer Foundation Board. Uh, Dr. McGinty, uh, Geraldine McGinty, uh, on my left, did her medical training in Ireland at the National University, then came to the United States for residency at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, she did a fellowship in general and women's imaging at Mass General Hospital in Boston. Uh, then while working at Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx, she completed an MBA at Columbia University. She's volunteered in economics work for the American College of Radiology for more than 10 years and has, I can tell you from working with her over the years, has, has been a great force for combining, we talked about before, that emphasis on quality and the emphasis on uh, cost and uh, getting overall cost down. She served as an advisor to the CPT editorial board, uh, the Joint Commission, and the National Quality Forum. She's currently the ACR's member of the AMA Relative Value Update Committee, and she's chair of the ACR's Commission on Economics. She's a, a partner now in a 70-person multi-specialty medical group uh, on, on Long Island. And then uh, finally, last but not least, Dr. Stephen Edge is the Alfiero Foundation Endowed Chair in Breast Oncology and the Chief of Breast Surgery at Roswell Park Cancer Institute. Uh, and is a professor of surgery and oncology at the State University of New York in Buffalo. Uh, he attended medical school at Case Western, trained at the Case Western Inter Integrated Surgery Program and the surgery branch of the National Cancer Institute. His clinical focus is obviously on breast cancer, and his research agenda includes the community-wide evaluation and improvement of the quality of cancer care, and he'll talk some uh, about his experiences in delivery and payment reform there. Uh, Dr. Ed serves on the Commission of, on Cancer of the American College of Surgeons, the board of the National Comprehensive Care Cancer Network and is past chair of the American Joint Committee on Cancer. So uh, obviously a number of perspectives, related perspectives on how to get better care at a lower cost uh, for uh, cancer patients through clinician leadership. And uh, we're going to start out with some short opening comments from each of uh, uh, these clinical leaders and I'll turn uh, uh, first to you, uh, Alan. Mark, thanks um, and good morning everyone. Um, I'll make a few brief comments uh, from the perspective of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, the largest physician um, um, uh, organization uh, uh, devoted strictly to, uh, uh, to, to cancer care. Um, the, 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 the concept of healthcare reform, um, of which payment reform is a, is an, is a component, um, requires a coordinated effort. All the pieces have to work together. The physician side is important, and we're here to discuss it today. Uh, I can tell you that uh, in the oncology community, there is um, a, uh, an enormous and pent-up willingness to change, to change the way uh, uh, care is uh, uh, paid for. We understand uh, that a, a sole reliance on fee-for-service medicine will not take us into the future. Um, we, are, we are ready to do this, but this cannot be done um, by physicians alone. Um, we need the payer side. And in oncology, of course, 60 to 65 percent of cancer patients are Medicare beneficiaries. The big player is Medicare and CMS. And in order to, in order to do uh, meaningful payment reform, um, we need to run pilots and lots of them. We're betting um, uh, 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 that we can uh, that we can reform uh, uh, the, the payment system uh, uh, based on sitting around uh, uh, around tables and writing things down. No one or no group is smart enough to do it. There are unintended consequences, and we have to run pilots. Um, unfortunately, at, at this point, we have had little success. Although we have approached CMS on numerous occasions, um, it is disappointing to us. Uh, where we stand today. In October of 2010, we went to the Innovation Center with the first uh, proposal to do uh, a test of bundled payment in oncology. Um, as of today, uh, there is no bundled payment, uh, 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 at, at least uh, the, the uh, active bundled payment uh, model running in, in, uh, um, in CMS for oncology care. Uh, we're still waiting. We've been back. Um, there are many 
there are many moving parts. Uh, it's very easy to say, we're just going to go to a bundle payment or episode payment, boom, great idea. Now how do you do it? What's in the bundle? I, we could go on for days about this. So we have to run pilots. And if we run a pilot in colon cancer, we learn how to run a pilot in colon cancer. And while we learn some principles, running a pilot in breast cancer, or running a, a, a bundle payment model in breast cancer is different. And running one in lung cancer is different still. So not only do we need to run pilots, but we need to run lots of them. I am terrified about this inertia because the plans that, that Congress is think, are, are thinking of, coupled with the SGR fix, uh, asks for a, a, a period of stability of four years, five years, six years, whatever. But, if, but my concern is those four or five or six years, we are going to sit on our behinds um, and we are going to end up at the end of that journey and we're going to say, does anybody know what to do? Have we tested it? Does it work? Have we, uh, have we seen the problems in the field and fixed them? So we need um, um, uh, willing and, and um, enthusiastic um, and an active participation um, uh, on the payer side, especially CMS. We're not seeing it yet. And we need to involve patients. It is unrealistic and unfair to say that physicians are um, responsible and can, and can fix this problem without getting patients uh, involved. Um, th there was a recent study in health affairs uh, where focus groups uh, involving close to 220 patients were presented with the following scenario. There's test A, it costs 200 bucks. There's test B, it costs 1,000 bucks. Test B occasionally, rarely, will find something that test A doesn't find. Which one do you want? Almost every single patient chose the $1,000 test. And when you read the comments, there are comments that go like this. If it's more expensive, it's better. Anybody knows that. If it's more expensive, it's better. Give me the most expensive test. Comments like, I've paid my premiums for years. It's payback time. If I can get the $1,000 test, that's better than getting the $200 test because I get more value back from all those tens of thousands of dollars I've paid in over the years. You can be a physician and you can explain things to patients, but without the patient's involvement, without addressing this complexity, without incentivizing um, and, and having some reason uh, for, for patients to be involved, um, we go nowhere. And this, in part, involves benefit design. In, and I'll just give you one example of the way oncology drugs are paid for. In Part B, Medicare, CMS pays for 80% of the cost of cancer treatment. So they'll pay 80% of the cost of a drug regimen that is curative in most patients in a particular disease, and 80% of the drug cost for someone who's taking their fifth line of therapy for an incurable cancer that has a chance of responding to that drug of 0.1%. What is the sense of doing that? And if the patient has, 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 a, has coinsurance, uh, their involvement in those decisions is, is, is relatively small. So we put the same barrier or the same uh, 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 benefit design in front of highly curative therapy uh, as we put in front of therapy that has very little or no value. We need uh, to, to address benefit design. And my last point is all of this must be wrapped in a very comprehensive quality monitoring program. Uh, because as we change the way uh, incentives are, are, are aligned, as we change the way physicians are paid, et cetera, we must be able to know that the right care is being given at the right time in the right way. Uh, as mentioned before, that no one is, is skimping on care, et cetera, et cetera. We actually have reached a point with the proliferation of electronic medical, medical records that we are um, at the cusp of a, being able to do this in real time without a great deal of practice effort. The, th the care can be, uh, is, is electronic, the case records can be um, uh, aggregated, accumulated, analyzed, and fed back to physicians. Uh, in, in ASCO, we have formed a program that we call Cancer Link, which is the ability to harness all of this together to provide quality in real time and to analyze how care is delivered in ways we have never before imagined. Close to 90% of oncology practices now have EMRs, so we are ready to do this. Um, 
Uh, but, you know, one of the interesting ironies is that we are looking for, um, <clears throat> for, for some assistance. This is not an, a, 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 an inexpensive uh, uh, endeavor, um, but, uh, and ASCO is willing to invest heavily, but we need some help. At the time when the, when the government is spending billions and billions of dollars to get EMRs into practices, it's hard to find a few million dollars to harness that technology to actually make it work. There's a little bit of a disconnect there. And uh, with that, I'll conclude. Thanks. Uh, that's uh, plenty of t a foundation for our further discussion, too. Uh, thank you, Alan. I'd like to turn now to Dr. McGinty. Thanks very much, and thank you to Mark and Kavita for having us today, and obviously the Merkin Foundation, and I couldn't agree more that as physicians it's vital that we're at the table, and as radiologists we're very, very pleased to be part of this discussion, and as we've thought about the opportunities for real uh, reform and how what physicians can bring to that, we're very excited about uh, what I think is a real and um, emerging but as yet unrealized opportunity to drive quality and probably also significantly manage costs um, with the uh, use of decision support for appropriate imaging. And what we're looking to see is where we can, can encourage the use of incentives to actually drive the use of decision support and radiologist consultation. Um, the American College of Radiology for many years has had a very robust set of appropriateness criteria that have been evidence and consensus based, developed with our own experts and in collaboration with other specialties. And those have now been used to develop a set of mobile apps and web based apps that are also embedded in electronic health records. So when Representative Schwartz talks about having something on my phone, that's possible today. Um, that's something that can be used at the point of care for a physician as they're making a decision around imaging with a patient. So the patient that's insisting on an MRI, this is a way to actually work with them and say, let me show you why that's probably not the test that's going to help you. Um, so this is a, these are tools that are available now. The question is how can we encourage the use of incentives to, to make sure that they, um, they are perpetrated through the healthcare system. And our goal is appropriate imaging. Yes, there is going to be some imaging that won't happen, but there's also imaging that should happen more than it's happening now. Obviously, screening mammography is one of those programs that we're always looking to encourage, but things like uh, screening CT colonography uh, can encourage participation in a screening program for colon cancer. It doesn't happen as much as it should now, and these types of decision support systems can help that. Um, and I think if you compare that with the radiology benefit management programs that many of you who have commercial insurance are familiar with, where rather than a collaborative process with your physician, your physician submits a request, 48 hours later there's a no, and then you start the whole process again. We want this to be a real, uh, as a, patient, a, a process of patient and physician engagement around a decision around imaging. And, um, obviously, there's been, there have been many discussions about the use of appropriate imaging, um, the Choosing Wisely campaign. Many of those, one of the, the tests about which we're asked to, to think more carefully are imaging tests. And, and really, you know, I, I, I'm probably a little biased, but it's because imaging has really revolutionized medical care. Um, and it has so much to offer in diagnosis and, and, and driving appropriate treatment. But we're fully on board with the fact that it needs to be used wisely. Um, we as a specialty are, are totally committed to this transition to, to value-based care, um, but I think it's important to think about what's really going to help motivate physicians to change. And we are a referral-based specialty. We tend to see patients almost overwhelmingly that are sent to us by other physicians. Um, and we've been living in, as, as all physicians have, in a fee-for-service system. And with the cuts that have happened to our specialty, with set by 2014, some services cut almost 60%, you can imagine that that does tend to blunt the appetite for change at the individual physician level. Uh, we've seen many more sticks than carrots in the recent past, and that's where like, we would like to encourage the discussion to go more in terms of meaningful incentives. Um, programs like PQRS are limited in their applicability to radiologists, um, so we definitely need to see some more meaningful measures. Um, we, as a specialty, have been used to practicing to guidelines since MQSA in the early 90s. We, we get it. Um, we just need to build an incentive system that's going to actually support that, that change. Right. Thanks, Dr. McGinty. And I'd like to turn now to Dr. Edge. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. And on behalf of the American College of Surgeons, thank you very much for uh, inviting us uh, to participate in this uh, important event today. Uh, I'd, I'd just like to uh, say to begin that uh, I think there has been a real sea change. And um, as uh, Dr. Lichter said, physicians uh, 
are, are recognize the need and are now motivated to change. I mean, most, most physicians get up in the morning and want to do a good job. They don't get up in the morning and want to do a bad job. Um, and uh, uh, they can truly be partners in, in this change. Uh, the American College of Surgeons is uh, moving aggressively to try to understand and uh, develop uh, value-based uh, uh, programs and their uh, inspiring quality campaign uh, that, that they have undertaken under the leadership of David Hoyt, looking at uh, high-quality data, um, uh, strong evidence, um, uh, uh, verification of uh, uh, treatment and accountability. Uh, are, are moving the field of surgery forward, not just in cancer, but uh, uh, with surgical complications through the NISQIP program and the bariatric surgery program and the trauma program, as well as our robust uh, uh, cancer programs in collaboration with our partners across oncology. Uh, uh, data is, uh, is going to be a uh, key here. Um, there needs to be meaningful, real-time uh, registry data collection systems that help the doctor and provide information to help the patient. Um, uh, uh, the bundle payment model that we that you've addressed uh, uh, will be difficult to implement, uh, and I was uh, I'm going to highlight one bundle payment program that actually implemented and uh, worked and continues to work uh, at Roswell Park Cancer Institute. Uh, almost a decade ago, we developed a bundled uh, case rate for a full year of breast cancer care, from the time of diagnosis through. Um, uh, a full year of treatment, whether that woman had um, an, a non-invasive cancer for which she required uh, simple surgical excision and uh, no other treatment but perhaps um, uh, endocrine treatment, to a woman who with an advanced breast cancer, such as the young woman I treated last night with a large tumor that will require um, a mastectomy, uh, reconstructive surgery, radiation therapy, um, uh, chemotherapy and trastuzumab uh, treatment, uh, uh, very expensive uh, but potentially a life-saving treatment that's been developed through research supported by Congress. Um, uh, and uh, that program wa was implemented in collaboration with community partners. Uh, we had uh, uh, two groups of uh, private medical oncologists in our community who joined with our cancer center in uh, developing this program with uh, the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, organization in our, in our town. Uh, and um, we um, demonstrated that we could do this, that we save money, we reduced variability in care. Uh, the medical director had to go to his colleagues in the private community who were using epirubicin at the time instead of doxorubicin, which is much more expensive. And uh, we, uh, changed, uh, we changed behaviors. Um, that case rate uh, went on for three years. Um, it uh, became a big burden for the payer, and they uh, elected to stop it after the first three years uh, because of the administrative uh, burden of it separating out this relatively small population of patients, but the, the case rate clearly worked, and we now have an ongoing program for case rates for medical oncology, for chemotherapy, for breast cancer, and for radiation oncology. Uh, so these case rates can actually work and um, uh, across the community with uh, broad support uh, for the physicians. So I'd just like to conclude by saying, um, uh, echoing what Dr. Lichter said, we have to have support for data. And we have uh, excellent examples of registries that work in the United States. The Commission on Cancer's National Cancer Database maintains good information, though not optimal information, on 70 percent of all cancer patients treated in America. The American Society of Clinical Oncology has some novel ideas and concepts and has developed this novel program of cancer link that uh, will uh, uh, d uh, extract information from electronic records and make it really useful to patients uh, and to uh, their physicians. Um, and uh, um, we have to make these programs useful to providers, and I, I also share Dr. Lichter's concern about stagnation and, and, and the, how the devil will be in the details. I actually had a, hosted a dinner for a visiting professor last night in Buffalo, um, and one of our surgical oncology fellows has been in private practice in rural Minnesota for two years before coming and uh, raised the questions about value-based care and uh, bundled payments from the perspective of the physician in, in practice in a small rural community and how this will really affect things perhaps outside of uh, the key, the, the well-described things like breast cancer and colon cancer and how he dealt with uh, the daily work. So uh, we have a lot of work cut out for us, but I think the physicians of America are really on board uh, and looking for change and looking to collaborate. Uh, and as uh, Representative Cassidy says, they're some of the smartest people in America. Yeah. Well, from listening to all of you, and thank you, Dr. Edge, uh, for, that, uh, for those comments, uh, it sounds like it is a, a very opportune time for cancer care in the context of uh, uh, doing payment reform right. Uh, from, if I'm interpreting the comments uh, correctly, uh, there's a, a strong need, as we heard this morning from the um, elected officials here, for 
support for better data, but the components of putting that together are here and now, thanks to the, the uh, efforts that are ongoing with uh, cancer link, with the electronic record uh, availability in oncology practices, there is a foundation for this uh, meaningful registry uh, support that could be available in real time, that could incorporate uh, evidence-based expert guidelines, as, uh, uh, as Dr. McGinty uh, talked about, not just for uh, uh, imaging, but also for uh, therapy uh, as, as well. Um, so, and those data systems could help uh, uh, bring together the, the, the care coordination in a constructive way, as, uh, as Dr. McGinty uh, uh, also emphasized. So, what needs to, can we say a little bit more about what needs to happen, um, and particularly what kinds of policy reforms in, in, in Medicare uh, could, could, help make that, uh, could help make that happen? Uh, maybe starting with the, um, the, the next steps on these um, bundled payment ideas, which seems like could, uh, could reinforce it, but Alan, you also emphasize things that need to happen outside of uh, physician payment as well. So we'd like a, a little bit more discussion about uh, um, why, you know, if, the, if the opportunities are there, what's standing in the way and how can uh, physicians help lead those, uh, th those needed policy changes. Well, you know, it, it's, you know, listen, I don't know what's standing in the way. We're not, you know, we're not standing in the way. Um, we are ready, Mark, to do things, and you know, and you know we are. Um, the, but uh, of course, not everybody is. I, you know, there's no way we can say we have, um, um, uh, you know, uh, 33,000 members, and we've surveyed every one of them, and everybody is exactly at the same place. I mean, this is totally unrealistic. Um, but and, and the ability, Mark, to say to practice is, here's a demo. Um, if you want to come in the bundle or in the episode or in the uh, in, 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 a, in a capitated environment or, or whatever, um, come and join that program. If you want to stay where you are, stay where you are. So that first of all mm -hmm. takes away some of the some of the uh, uh, some of the fighting because the, or, the the part of the organiz the part of the physician community that says the status quo is perfectly fine with me can stay where they are. But once we show it works. Um, uh, the ability for us to say we've tested it and it works and the ability for the skeptics to say, you know, I've read the stuff, it does work, we're, we're willing to do this. Um, to me, that's how you bring this along. There is no sense in saying we can, do, we can just simply dictate, here's the new system um, and, and, and let's do it. Um, and, and, and Mark, I, I, I emphasize uh, the importance of, 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 of a robust quality monitoring system. You know, we had an experience in this country in the late 80s and early 90s with, with, with a, a lot of managed care and capitation. Um, our, our 1,500 doctor practice at the University of Michigan um, uh, went <coughs> substantially under a capitated um, um, uh, a system, um, and it worked okay. Um, it, you know, and, and, and we, it, had it stayed, we would have continued, I think, to reap benefit. What happened was there was no robust quality monitoring system. So a patient could tell the story of, I went in and I had X and my doctor wouldn't order this test and later on I, you know, ended up with this terrible problem. Um, and, and, you know, I, you know a, a handful of stories like that uh, is a torpedo in the side of the boat um, versus saying, wait a minute, we've, we, we've, we've, we've got, you, you're, you were cared for exactly <clears throat> in the right way because we have all the quality data to show that you, you were managed correctly. What happened was um, unfortunate and, and unexpected and unanticipated and, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, if, we don't, if, if we go down this road again through bundles and, and, and capitations and episodes and, and, so, and shared savings and so forth and don't couple it with a, with a robust quality monitoring program that, that assures patients um, and physicians and payers that the care is being delivered correctly, we are going to repeat this 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 experiment all over again and, and torpedo this. So the uh, demos, lots of them, quality monitoring, let it roll out. Uh, we can do this. If we have five years to do it, we need to start this afternoon, um, not spend the next two years figuring out how to start. And just uh, I, I, would, I do want the comments from the, the rest of you on, on this general topic, but just uh, continuing with this topic of robust quality monitoring, are the clinical groups who you think would be ready to uh, to, to stand up and participate in these efforts, um, uh, do they have the, the quality measurements that are needed to, to support it that uh, you just identify as critical? There's been an awful lot of work by ASCO, ACR, ACS on 
uh, developing better guidelines and the foundations for uh, these kinds of quality measures? Are, are those ready to go? So we, we meet as specialty societies uh, together under an envelope called the, the Council of Medical Specialty Societies. There are 39 societies. Their combined membership represents close to 700,000 physicians in this country. Every single society either has a uh, a robust res registry uh, and quality program like, this, like the surgeons and the radiologists and the thoracic surgeons and the cardiologists, um, or um, is in the process of developing this. Um, this is, Mark, the, the perfect example of physician leadership. Quality of medical care is a physician responsibility. Is <clears throat> it's not a responsibility of payers. It's not a responsibility of government, although everybody is involved. It is a fundamental responsibility of the profession of medicine, and the profession of medicine is standing up to do it. If we are allowed to do it, if we are supported in doing it, um, it will make a huge difference and will permit um, payment reform to take hold and to actually work. I'd like to open this up to the, the rest of the panel. Sure. Thanks, Mark. And, and I, I, with regard to the question about bundled payments, as you and I know, because we've been spending some time working on, on, on some for radiology, the nitty-gritty of how you set that bundle up is, is not a, a small challenge. You know, when does it start? When does it end? How do you, who do you attribute to? You know, what do you do with the unexpected events? And it's certainly for a specialty like ours in, in imaging where, as I said, we're not typically owning the patient ourselves. We're getting referrals. How do we fit into those bundles? But it's something that you know, we can't just put away and ignore and hope it'll go away. And as you know, it, it's something we're very focused on. Um, and understanding how we can function in those in those bundles, and, and I will uh, to the question about you know relevant quality measures. I, I think simply that is an opportunity, especially for our specialty, to develop more meaningful quality measures um, that we can so that we can participate. Thank you, um, Steve. Well, I think uh, uh, an area that requires some rapid support is the development of robust systems across across society that collect information on how patients are treated. I mean, each of us has. Uh, excellent systems. Uh, there's an enormous opportunity for collaborative efforts between those and an enormous opportunity for payers to participate in those. Uh, but, and we have, we have the information in many, in many systems that are available. There's uh, more and more the ability to do natural energy searching of electronic records for, for information uh, as I think uh, Dr. Lichter's group has aptly demonstrated in the last two years. Um, but there is uh, not the, the um, there's not been the support to to get that on a population-wide basis. Can a basis. bundled uh, payment initiative help support that, or are there other stuff? Well, that I, th I think that needs to be supported, and bundled payments can come out of that because then you have all the data on how how much care really costs. And um, we also have the quality measures through guidelines, through uh, guidelines from ASCO, from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, uh, um, and those can be uh, with these robust systems. One can actually test whether those measures are valuable, rather than developing three measures and testing them over five years, we can rapidly test uh, many, many, many different aspects of care and concordance with guidelines and reasons for non-concordance with care uh, quite rapidly. Uh, but there needs to be meaningful support for developing these kind of population-wide data systems. I would like to open this up to comments from, uh, from people who are here in the room. Uh, we do have a, a microphone again. If uh, there are any uh, uh, comments or questions, uh, uh, please raise your hand. And uh, let us know who you are when you ask the question. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, David Hogberg with the National Center for Public Policy Research. Uh, just two quick questions. Um, on bundled payments, I'm just wondering if uh, you see CMS giving you the flexibility to say, you know, rebundle the payments, by which I mean that. Uh, you know, outside of medicine, uh, producers often bundle and you know rebundle uh, the package uh, based on what you know consumers want, and need, and you know that can change over time. And I'm just wondering if you know medicine is going to have that flexibility under uh, CMS and the, the new health care law. Um, and if you think that's important as well. Um, second, uh, with regard to the, the health affairs article, uh, I'm just wondering if there's any proposals or any, even any talk of letting patients control some of the funds and let them share in the savings so that uh, you know, maybe those $200 tests might seem a little more um, uh, appealing um, versus the $1,000 tests when, you know, oh, I only pay $200 and I get to save some of the rest versus the $1,000 payments. Well, you know, uh, that may happen a little more when, you know, 
you achieve the you sharing the savings versus thinking that someone else is you know paying the bill. So those are my two questions, and I'm just curious to what you have to say. So you know, addressing addressing the latter question about in, in, involving patients in this, um, there needs you know there clearly needs to be some some way of doing this when when you know this is this is an observation that's been made uh, you know over over uh, uh, decades if, if if you have a a, a product and service um, and there's just total price insensitivity i mean there's just pick um, um, whatever you want there's it, there's hardly a system that could be designed to ensure that you um, um, drive costs as high as humanly possible and we've designed a system that's it's perfect at that. Um, so, um, you know, how you do it uh, is, you know, to some extent un understandable, but how it's implemented is, is, is complicated. Um, uh, obviously, uh, health savings accounts uh, change patients' behavior when, when patients believe that, you know, I actually am taking money out of this account to buy this test. Um, there's, um, there's much more um, uh, consciousness about this. Um, the physicians have to be involved. I, will, I would challenge um, uh, um, you to, to, to talk to the physicians in, in this room and to say to them, to say to Dr. Edge, he probably knows because he's, he's so involved in this, but for most docs, if you say, how much is a CT of the abdomen at your institution? How much is an MRI of the spine? How much is a, is a, a, a this, that, and the other? Most of us have no idea. I mean, it's just we don't, it's not something that is that is in our consciousness. So the <laughs> yes, there you go. Um, and then there's that whole there, there's that whole segment. So it, it's it's and and it's it's you know we we have established in ASCO something called the Cost of Care Task Force uh, because we recognize that that um, we need to begin to talk to patients about cost. When I went to to, to medical school. Um, and, and I, I, I venture to say my colleagues were the same. We were taught cost has nothing to do with medical care. It has nothing to do with medical care. What has to do with medical care is the, your, your only responsibility in your life is that patient sitting in front of you and to get them the best. Forget about everything else. We have to recognize that, that, that those days, um, is certainly in oncology care, have passed. We talk to patients about the, 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 the Toxicity of therapy. This this has the following toxicity to the pulmonary system. It has the following toxicity to the bone marrow system. It has the following toxicity to the renal system, and it has the following toxicity potentially to your financial system. Um, and we have to bring all of those uh, uh, things together uh, 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 and involve patients. Um, how to do it is a um, uh, is complicated, but I. I think all of us know intuitively, if the patients do not get involved in this, it's extremely difficult for physicians alone to solve this problem. Dr. McGinney? I can definitely tell you, but we won't. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think the, the, the Brill article highlighted some significant differences in cost between hospital settings and outpatient settings, and a lot of that is around the technical component. But I think it's important if you, if you start to look at the actual physician service, and since we're talking about physician leadership, um, to Dr. Cassidy's point, you know, sometimes when you see that billboard, you know, it's like gas station sushi. You know, you want to make sure that you're not just going for the cost and it's not going to have downstream consequences. That, that, and, and we're certainly seeing this in the commercial population where patients are actually getting financial incentives to be steered away from the provider that their physician has, has requested that they go to for imaging and, and by, the, by their payer. Um, you know, the, the potential loss of that physician relationship where I know what Surgeon X wants when they ask for this, they know my level of confidence and they know what, how you know how to to take my results. That you, you can potentially lose that if you just go for the lowest cost provider. But I do think we have to get patients engaged. And I and believe me, as a radiologist and as a specialty, we own that it's our challenge to educate our patients about what quality means in imaging. And Dr. Edge, uh, since you've got some experience with uh, uh, the bundled payment system, mm -hmm. my my guess is that the unfortunate patient that you saw last night is lucky in the sense that she came to Roswell Park in a program well, that's, that's, focusing so. yes. on, uh, that's focusing <laughs> on uh, more coordinated care, but right. someone like her, even if she has an HSA, is going to be way past uh, uh, the, the out-of-pocket limit, yet on the other hand, if she's getting better care, getting effective surgery, getting her complications managed, getting treatment according to the latest evidence, uh, she's probably going to have not only better outcomes, but significantly lower costs than she would otherwise. Is there any way for her to 
uh, share in some of those uh, systems? Well, I think, I think when we talk about engaging the patients with it, at the time that they're diagnosed with a cancer, I think one has to be careful to expect that patients are going to fully recognize the, the cost. I mean, you know, this young woman um, um, ha has, a, has a terrible life-threatening disease um, at a very young age, and for her to be thinking which dollar sign I'm going to go for is unrealistic, and she's not going to. She's going to go where her physicians recommend, where her family recommends, and um, and she doesn't care about the cost, just like the person doesn't care about the the, the cost she, of the scan. She so care about, she does care about the quality and the complications, right? right. Of course, and yeah. uh, and of course, we don't provide her we don't provide her any real information about the quality. She just goes on reputation, which may or may not may or may not be valuable. So, so I, th I think we have to be careful about simply having saying the patient will be um, you know a part of this discussion. I mean, perhaps for primary care services or for long term care issues. But at the acute episode, when much of the care is uh, being put in place for uh, oncology patients, it's a, it's a bit difficult for our patients. Oh, I, think, I think, Steve, if, if, the care, if the care is bundled, to some extent, this comes out of the equation. That is, Absolutely. Her, her payer has said, this is, this is a good value, has pre-negotiated uh, 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 the payment, and, and then, um, you know, in, in that situation, the patient the, the patient, the, the discretionary piece is, is taken care of. Uh, absolutely. So, and I always also be careful to think that the person who has this very bad disease is going to be more a financial risk than the person who is uh, less of a disease. I, I'm not sure that's fair in our society, that because you happen to be the lucky person to have the bad cool. disease, cool. that you're at a much higher financial risk than somebody who is ductal carcinoma in situ is going to get a simple surgical excision. Uh, so we have to address that. Uh, my impression from the way that you've implemented the bundle so far, that it was really done, as you said, it's not you don't have a cost comparison there, but right. it's really done to prom promote better coordinated care uh, and we for save money. the patient. Right. So it's really about better quality, yeah. and the incidental fact is that it's uh, it costs less. some cost, some cost right. savings. But the patient too. had no, actually the patients may not even have known that they were in a bundled payment. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet we don't have these kinds of systems in place very widely, even though mm -hmm. uh, you all are saying it's time to, to, to move forward systematically to get there and some good suggestions about how to do it. I have time for one more comment. Enjoyed all the comments from my colleagues. I want to piggyback on what you just, the question you just asked, because it did sound like you came up with an excellent program that contained costs, and you said that, that it was controlling costs and providing quality. But I also heard you say, correct me if I'm wrong, that they ended the program, the, ins the payers ended the program. So could you give us just a little background on why that was the case? Well, well they, they ended this, that particular program because it turned out that the, just taking those patients in this group of community physicians in Roswell Park the, and carving them out of all of the, uh, all of the hundreds of thousands of patients that they covered, taking 100 or 150 cases out and carving them out was uh, an administrative burden at the payer. But I think if this was scaled up so that there were uh, a larger scale of um, a bundle payments across multiple payers and across across multiple diseases, that, that, that burden would go away if it became an expectation. And it was also eight years ago when we were doing this, and the informatics systems have changed dramatically during that time frame, and I think that uh, uh, this, the burden would be a lot less. But just to, to follow up on that, so I, mean, I, I guess this might be the difference between one-off demonstration programs and one-off pilots, which have to exist in the, you know, the system as it right. is at the time, which reflects all of the, the right. lack of support for right. these kinds of efforts that you all are describing, the, the kinds of efforts that you all are saying need more systematic support. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like this is a, a time maybe for a move into pilots uh, and opportunities for physicians to have flexibility in finding the right place but that it needs to be part of a much more systematic and yeah. clear long-term strategy so that it's not viewed as just a, a one-off uh, right. sunk cost by payers yeah. or by physicians. I mean, you go, to the, you go to conferences and I go to conferences and the, the, you know, our, 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 the, the, the representatives spoke this morning. We see hundreds or thousands of fabulous pilots and, you, and, and they work. And you say, what happened to that program? Well, we, we folded it, we closed it, or you know, this, that, and the other. Mark, the pilots need to be done broadly, and then they need to be done in such a way that if they work, they can scale. We must learn and take the knowledge and advance the system. We can't just run the experiment, uh, write an academic paper about it, and then go back to doing things. And, and right. that's, that's where we need to take things like, right. like a, if we learn something at Roswell Park, we need to be able to scale it. This is where CMS can do it, because yeah. by definition, they're scale. Okay, I think that's uh, actually a, a great point to end on. I want to thank you all for an excellent discussion about improving cancer care.
And uh, I would also like to invite our, our next panel up uh, while I introduce them. Uh, this is our, our last panel for the afternoon dealing with another very important area of care for patients, and that's heart disease care. Um, we're going to be hearing from uh, experts in uh, uh, three different specialties, uh, including uh, Jim Fasoulis, uh, Jeff Rich, and, and David Barb. Uh, Jim recently stepped down as Senior Vice President for Advocacy at the American College of Cardiology, where he focused on ensuring the voice of cardiovascular professionals uh, made it through uh, at the federal, state, and uh, uh, level, and in regulatory programs. And uh, I can tell, I tell you from working with him over the years, Jim has been instrumental in uh, developing policy ideas for uh, improving access to, to quality, uh, efficient cardiovascular care. Uh, Jim previously has served as a pediatrics and um, pediatric cardiology professor at the University of Arkansas and has been a practicing uh, pediatric cardiologist prior to coming to uh, D.C. Uh, he's also served as a congressional health staffer uh, and uh, worked with the, uh, uh, the Medicare Commission. So his uh, involvement in both the clinical side of medicine and uh, uh, in the uh, uh, policy side uh, goes way back and is a kind of model for uh, what we've been emphasizing with the, the, the Merkin Initiative. Um, uh, Dr. Jeff Rich, uh, very glad to have him back here just after a long travel back from uh, Asia, uh, is currently a practicing cardiothoracic surgeon at Centara Heart Hospital, and he's president of the Mid-Atlantic Cardiothoracic Surgeons uh, Limited in Norfolk, Virginia. He's also the immediate past president of the Society for Thoracic Surgeons, uh, and his uh, policy leadership doesn't end there. Uh, Jeff served as director of the Center for Medicare Management uh, at uh, CMS uh, in uh, uh, 2008 through 2009, where he was intensely involved with Medicare payment policy and uh, payment system changes for provider services. Uh, he's also had leadership positions with the National Quality Forum, uh, the Ambulatory Quality Alliance, the, uh, the uh, Quality Alliance Steering Committee, uh, and uh, other programs. Uh, he's a founding member of the and uh, director at large for the Virginia Cardiac Surgery Quality Initiative, which is another uh, 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 leading example of quality improvement through sharing data and uh, uh, working uh, collaboratively to improve care involving 15 hospitals and all of the cardiac surgeons in the state of Virginia. Uh, and uh, we're very pleased to have him with us today, too. Uh, uh, Dr. David Barb, uh, uh, appreciate uh, your taking time to be here, David. Uh, David is the chair-elect of the American Medical Association Board of Trustees, as well as a member of its executive committer, committee, and he's also on the AMI uh, Health IT Advisory Group. He's been uh, active in the, M uh, in the AMA through the Missouri State Medical Association uh, for more than 25 years, and he's been continuously on the Missouri State uh, Medical Association Board for more than uh, 20 years, uh, previously serving as president. Uh, he's uh, also uh, been a longtime member of the Legislative Committee and uh, the Missouri Medical Political Action Committee. Uh, he uh, has been in uh, uh, previously an in independent practice uh, uh, for uh, 15 years after completing his residency at the University of Kansas uh, program at St. Joseph's Hospital in Wichita, and he received a Master in Health Administration from uh, University of Missouri Columbia as well. Now serves as uh, the Regional Division President of the 650 Physician Multi-Specialty uh, Integrated uh, Group there, and serves on the Executive Management Team of uh, Mercy Health. So uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Barb, for being with us today too. Uh, I think we're going to start out uh, actually with comments. Uh, from, from you. So. Great. Thank you, Mark. Really do appreciate the invitation to be here. Uh, appreciate Brookings and uh, Merkin. Uh, and as much as anything, appreciate the audience here that you have an interest in this topic and that you're willing to take time to come and listen to this dialogue. I think it's been a great dialogue. I started out with about four or five bullet points, and that's what my page looks like now after <laughs> listening to the last two hours. Um, I'm going to try to be brief, uh, I, but I could go on all day. This is such an important topic. Uh, I hope that you have seen from the comments that have been made today that physicians are really ready to engage. We are absolutely ready to be part of the solution going forward in uh, payment reform, and as well as in clinical and quality, if you will, reform. Uh, we have not only a health care cost crisis in this country, but we have a health crisis in this country. If you think about 
100 million Americans either have diabetes or prediabetes right now, and that will go to 50% of our population in less than 10 years. And 90 million people have hypertension. A fair part of those are uncontrolled, may not even have a regular source of care. Those are precursor illnesses, chronic diseases, to some of the cardiac events that we're going to talk about today, uh, stroke, heart attack, and such. And we have to address those. And my suggestion would be that we cannot address either part of this equation. We can't address the cost side or the quality side without addressing both. So as you listen to the dialogue today, always conflate those two because I, I just think it's impossible to, to approach this without doing that. Um, you will hear, <clears throat> I think some of my comments will be a little bit repetitious, and if you believe that to be the case, it probably means these are important points. If you've heard it from several of the speakers today, let it resonate with you and, and try to go with it. We'll start very briefly with addressing the SGR, uh, since that has been obviously the backbone of Medicare physician pay payment for uh, over almost 20 years, um, actually over 20 years now. The problem with that, as you know, has been that any attempt to incentivize, if you will, physicians has been, has required a blunt approach. I mean, you can use a stick, as was referenced earlier, and that is about the only lever that Medicare had. Well, let's just cut physician payments. That'll be what we do. We're, we're going to cut payments if they don't do what we need or if they spend more than we need to spend. That, number one, it hasn't worked. Number two, it completely ignores the breadth of Medicare payment. The physician payment piece, as was articulated earlier, is a very small piece. And even if you improve physician efficiency, it doesn't accrue, if you will, or benefit or incentivize the physicians in that behavior. It saves on the payer side. It saves on the hospital side. It often does not save and, in fact, may increase cost on the physician side to get the physician to do what we need them to do to really step up and engage and in the cost and the quality arena. So breaking down the Medicare silos has to be part of this. Um, and I won't go long on it, but uh, if you haven't seen the draft proposal from House Energy and Commerce and Ways and Means that came out last Wednesday, I strongly recommend that you look at that. Uh, it really does outline a very good framework for a period of stability, and yet for relatively active, fairly aggressive involvement in these multiple alternative payment opportunities that uh, have been alluded to earlier uh, that need to be across practice settings, they need to be across specialties, they need to be uh, evaluated specifically for scalability and applicability in settings other than the one in which they're piloted. Um, all of that, to some extent, is in uh, their draft proposal, and I encourage you to review it and offer comments uh, that they are soliciting. The one comment that I'd make, and I'm sorry that Representative Schwartz is not here any longer, uh, s there are some proposals that have a pretty good interim process, but still um, provide for a financial cliff at the end with regard to physician payment. The AMA does not feel that that is a, an appropriate approach to that. So as we look at legislation that attempts to bridge this transitional uh, time frame from where we are now to where we hope to be over the next five or ten years, um, we, we have to eliminate the cliff at the end. A uh, couple of other um, comments have to relate back to what you've heard mentioned regarding flexibility and that this is not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, as a family physician, family physicians can practice in a multitude of settings all the way from literally solo independent practice to someone such as myself who practices in a very large integrated group. Same applies to a great de degree to specialists. We also, all physicians span a variety of geographic settings. Some may be very close to tertiary centers, some may be remote from it. Um, we have to approach this with a spirit, if you will, of pluralism so that we uh, have models, payment models, and care models that uh, fit the specialty and the geography of the physician as well as the patient population. 
Um, I, as kind of the sole primary care physician on the two panels today, uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about uh, some of the payment me mechanisms, and I'll, I'll, I'll end up talking about the primary care patient-centered medical home. Uh, we have heard discussion about shared savings some today. Um, we've heard about bundled payments. Um, we haven't touched much on straight out care coordination and mechanisms for paying for that, uh, but those clearly need to be built into this. Uh, that is a centerpiece of the primary care patient-centered medical home, uh, many of which are up and running. I will tell you that the investment in those is significant. Uh, the Missouri State Medical Association just had its annual meeting this past weekend, and one of the top, one of the presenters was a family physician from North Kansas City area uh, who's in a medium-sized family medicine group. I think they have 15 family docs in their group, and they are really taking a leap of faith by establishing a primary care patient-centered medical home uh, done right, done with all the bells and whistles, and their roll-up incremental cost for doing this is about $13 PM PM. The best payer in their market that is willing to reimburse them for doing what they're doing is going to give them $3 PM PM. And that's one commercial carrier. Somebody from the audience stood up and said, well, if you can get four other commercial carriers to each give you $3 PM PM, doesn't that get you up to your $12? And the answer, no, the math doesn't work that way. <laughs> that's still just $3 PM PM. So, this is a huge leap of faith for practices that are willing to do this, and the same goes for some of these other p alternative payment models that are being piloted that often ab address uh, specialty care. It takes significant infrastructure to begin to even stand these up and get them started, and that is a significant barrier for physicians, particularly those who are not part of a larger integrated system, and that still represents well over half of our physician population right now. One or two minutes on my own experience. Um, my group, Mercy in Missouri, Southwest Missouri, was one of the 10 physician group practice demonstration projects. Uh, University of Michigan was one of those as well. Um, and you might not expect a relatively rural uh, uh, location health system to have been one of those, but we were. Uh, we were one of the five that actually managed to affect savings so that we achieved some shared savings uh, that was then paid as, I think all of you know the structure of that, based on our quality performance. Um, we as you probably also know, most of the quality measures were ambulatory measures, outpatient type measures. You don't save money, especially in the short run, doing a better job managing cholesterol levels and hemoglobin A1Cs and blood pressures and doing you know, foot exams. You save money in the short run with respect to high cost utilization such as hospitalization. So our focus was on reducing initial admissions and reducing readmissions. A lot of that effort came through the cardiac care uh, end of things, particularly with respect to CHF management and reduction of admissions and readmissions. And I won't go through the details right now of how we did that, uh, but in addition to that being a significant part of our Medicare cost savings, which allowed us then to achieve a little bit of the shared savings, we now are, we have the lowest CHF readmission rate in the state of Missouri hmm. by virtue of that. And so from time to time, papers will float out into the public domain that talk about, well, none of these programs have saved money, none of these programs have really shown consistent reduction in, or improvement in quality, reduction in readmissions, et cetera. Th that is not true. Have they blanket showed that? No. If you net the, AC, the uh, PGP demonstration project sites, did we save money in aggregate across 10 sites? No. But those who were successful managed to pull it off, improve both quality and saved money in that population. It can be done. Um, last thing I guess I'll mention is that um, a lot of this relates to data um, in the PGP project and I'm fearful that in our current ACO models we will not get data in a timely fashion. The PGP fiscal year was m April to March so let's say we ended one of those fiscal years in March of 2008. We didn't get data for that fiscal year until May of 2010. It was 15, almost 15 months before we got data on that fiscal year. The, the following fiscal year was already done and in the can. If there were 
changes that we needed to make based on feedback, it was too late to have even made them for the next year. So the timeliness of data, the accuracy of data is going to be critical, particularly as we interact with federal programs, CMS-sponsored programs. I have been a little bit more satisfied with some of the turnaround we get out of private payers, but we've got to get better data return uh, from our Medicare payers. Um, lots more I could say. I, I, I'll just wrap it up uh, by again remarking that physicians are ready to be leaders. We're ready to be partners. Um, just as in the clinical team, the physician cannot do it alone, and that was referenced earlier. We have to have all of the stakeholders at the table, the payers and the patients. Um, I guess I will make one other comment on patients. I, I have followed all of this for a long time, and I've looked at lots of different angles of it, as many of you have. The toughest nut for me personally to figure out in this whole deal is how do you engage the patient, get them to have some skin in the game without adversely affecting their decisions in terms of barriers to their care. That is really, really tough. And uh, although we continue to need to, we, we need to continue to work on that, I, I predict that will be one of our more difficult uh, pieces of this. So, okay. Thanks, uh, Mark. Thanks very much, Dr. Barb. Uh, Dr. Vasoulis? Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, I'm, I, you've heard an awful lot today. It, this has been amazing. I might change what I'm saying a little bit along the lines of highlighting a few of the things you've already heard and why that are important. Uh, and one of the things I think that came, I thought the most important you heard today was from Dr. Cassidy, seeing there has to be alignment of, of healing with the, with the payment. Uh, there are not a whole lot of economists in the room right now. I, I, I'm going to be careful what I say with one standing over me. But you cannot, you cannot drive this solely by the economics. You have to think about the care and the patients. And you, you have to bind those two together. If you're just going with the economy, economists on this, they have not been in there taking care of the patients. They've been patients maybe, but they don't have what we've experienced in trying to take care of the patients. Then I'm going to reemphasize on the data uh, stuff. The data and, and knowledge is going to drive the physician's behavior. Knowledge is what's going to change habits. And uh, I'll give you a couple a scenario if people might know what door to balloon is, but it's basically saying when a patient comes into the emergency room, they need their heart attack addressed within 90 minutes. They need to be into the cath lab. The artery has to be opened back up with a balloon and a stent put in within 90 minutes to get good outcomes. Hospitals thought they were all doing it in 90 minutes. With the NCDR registry, we could show them that they were really around two hours, two and a half hours. And when they had the knowledge that they weren't doing it at 90 minutes, they all changed. And now 90-something percent, Patrick, you might be getting me the right data, but over 90 percent of hospitals now are under 90 minutes getting that patient in to get that artery opened up and save the heart muscle, preventing more congestive heart failure. So that knowledge, not the economics, they got paid the same. It was harder for them to get in on the time. They had to do all sorts of systems. It also gets at the cost of what kind of systems have to be put in place to do that, the infrastructure needed. So remember, knowledge is as important at driving the physician's behavior as the economics and the incentives you go in there. Then you have to look at the other aspect of that knowledge and what your medical societies are doing with their guidelines and what cardiology has taken, guidelines, they've been doing it for 30 years with all the different cardiology societies and turning those into just like the uh, radiology into appropriate use criteria. Is this test appropriate at this time? Moving from just the appropriate use criteria on different testing like imaging into the choosing wisely, which I think most of you are aware of, where what are the things that patients should be thinking about? Do they need this test? One of the hardest things we have to deal with is, well, uh, he's, in, he's got gray hair, I'm no hair. It was a lot easier taking uh, care of a patient, uh, in my case, a child with a murmur, uh, and I could say this is just a normal thing, you don't need a test, but the younger physicians who couldn't be confident in that would often order a test that wasn't needed. And the pa the, the, nowadays, it's almost like every patient expects a test to be done to confirm a diagnosis when you don't, always don't have to do that. That's actually where the choosing wisely, I think, is going to help with that patient knowledge. We can take the, the, the recommendation from the 20 or 30 organizations now that have done it and say, look, you don't, really don't need this. The organizations have said that. 
moving from that into decision support tools such as that the college has in focus which tells whether a, it, both for a primary care doc and a cardiologist whether a test that they want to do is appropriate or not but tying that in with tracking it again with the registries and the data looking at how you stack up across your peers and where you are with your peers and then taking that and saying where are your deficits in your education and your knowledge and tying it into practice improvement modules that can be done online, tying it into the maintenance of certification so you get credit. Uh, some of you may be aware that the focus tool is required, which is the an imaging tool to look at uh, whether it's appropriate or not, is required in Delaware because of a fiasco with an RBM there. And we're seeing that when we start tying that education back to the physician, a 50% reduction in the amount of inappropriate studies. So these type of things can, can be wrapped up then into the bundle payments and one of the things we're looking at and, and Kavita and Mark have been very much involved is a program called Smart Care trying to put this in place in Wisconsin where you're looking at uh, stable uh, ischemic heart disease and uh, using a tool that helps the patient and the physician decide what testing is needed and whether they fit with the maximal medical management stenting like a PCI or the cabbage uh, that uh, Jeff's going to talk about. I th the other thing, of course, is the, the back and forth uh, that we need to have the communications. Uh, another point that I think is very important that was made today, and, and uh, David just made it uh, again, you work harder in Part B, you cost more in Part B, which of course is what drives the SGR up to get savings in Part A. And too often uh, Congress is focused on Part A sustainability. We look at how, how long is a trust fund going to be stay, uh, sustainable. And we forget that the savings that we're making by, by working harder in Part B are coming out of Part A. And some place in time we're going to have to get from a 1964 insurance model with the first the deductible for Part A is the first day of hospitalization which nowadays is a lot higher than the $700 or $500 it was back then, and forcing everyone to get Medigap insurance. It's another thing to think about. Uh, I, th I think with that, uh, just the current payment models, uh, the, the, the interaction and prevention between the societies also, I think, is very important in primary care. And if I had to leave you with one last pearl, you're looking at probably a profession that is the, the most risk adverse of all professions. And yet we're always talking about putting them at risk. So there are a few entrepreneurial spirits out there that will do that type of risk adverse thing. But remember, physicians are very risk adverse. They want to do what's best for the patient. And sometimes that risk aversion drives them. So if you're talking about trying to put all the physicians at risk, and you're expecting them to t tie back up to what Dr. Cassidy said, where the balance of that th healing and economics, just remember that when you start thinking about how much risk you want your physicians to be taking on. Uh, thanks very much, Jim. Uh, Jeff? Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Mark, for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. Um, I want to put it in perspective for you. 35% of Medicare dollars are spent on cardiovascular disease. And if you take the last panel and this panel, when I was at CMS, somewhere between 45 and 47 percent of healthcare dollars are spent on cancer and cardiovascular disease, heart failure, coronary artery disease, and cancer. And the order of those depends on the decile for the Medicare population, but it's a lot of money. So if we can drive significant payment reform in these three areas, you have almost half healthcare spending uh, in front of you. Um, and how do you do that? Well, you have to create a new payment system for physicians that holds, holds us clinically as well as financially accountable for the care that we deliver. We can no longer live in the silo of thinking that good clinical care is all that's going to be necessary to help uh, the healthcare system survive. We need to be financially responsible for the care. And as somebody had mentioned, we didn't learn that in medical school. We're learning that now. And in order to do that, we need some very real things. One is data, both clinical data and cost data. Um, secondly, we need to pay for quality. We need to create payment systems. And we have, Mark and I worked on payment systems that actually pay for quality and are in the Affordable Care Act. 
we need to create shared savings, which they have been created. That program started, and I think, Mark, you worked on it, and I finished it in 2008 in the physician uh, proposed fee schedule. Uh, and then we need to align incentives uh, with hospitals. He has, um, the, the classic thing is that, you know, physicians drive costs using their pen, and now it's electronic medical records because it's electronic entry, but we're the ones who are cost drivers, and most of the time you go out and talk to physicians, they don't understand that when they walk into the hospital, they get a hospital credit card. And they don't understand that the hospital has a DRG payment system and that when they overuse and you know, overuse resources and over test, the hospital doesn't get any more money. Uh, and so you're basically consuming valuable resources that aren't often uh, leading to better quality care. So if you break down those silos and make physicians understand how the uh, care is delivered and how the financial uh, flow is done, and the hospitals need to understand that on the physician side, will be a lot better off. And one of the ways to do that, and I'll talk about it in a minute, is bundle payments. And bundle payments could be for simply in cardiac surgery. We started with episodes of care, and those episodes can then be tied together. And, and the holy grail for cardiovascular disease, for Jim and our societies, is to pull the ACC database and the STS database together and provide a continuum of care look at coronary artery disease, for instance, stenting, cabbage, readmissions, and do that over an annual basis and, and pay for that on an annual basis and have the physicians and the hospitals work together and be sharing in the savings but also sharing in the risk. Um, so uh, an example of how data works. So the SDS has a database that's 20 years uh, old. It has five million records in it, and um, it's very robust. We've used it over the course of decades to improve quality. Uh, it risks, uh, tells us the risk and acuity of patients, and they have gone up over time because they're older and they have more, more comorbidities, thank you, uh, to primary care because they show, they show up now older with mo more comorbidities. So even in, it, in spite of that, the uh, uh, mortality for coronary artery bypass grafting has falling, fallen over a decade. Um, and the STS not only has used its database, but it has volunteered its database and created measures, and they're in the National Quality Forum Library, and I was the co-chair of the steering committee that created the national standards for cardiac surgery. So we used the database. We held ourselves accountable clinically. Uh, and a real-life example is one that Mark uh, mentioned is the Virginia Cardiac Surgery Quality Initiative. So this is a consortium that I, that I and two others started in 1996 in the state of Virginia. It has all the hospitals and all the cardiac surgeons in the state. We all are participants in the SDS database, but we created something that is very important that has been driving uh, high-quality, low-cost care in our state. We combine that database with CMS's administrative database, so we have a clinical financial tool so that as we improve quality, we could see its impacts on costs. Or we can maintain quality and reduce resource consumption and make sure that patient safety is, is kept uh, transparent and kept high. Um, and one example of that is an uh, initiative we started with transfusions. So we looked at reducing transfusions. Uh, uh, we did that over the course of two years. Uh, the savings in the state was $43 million. So, and that was with no effect uh, of quality of the patient care. In fact, quality went up because transfusions are dangerous. So just think about that. Fifteen hospitals, there are a thousand hospitals doing cardiac surgery. That's 165th. Multiply four mil $43 million by that, you're talking about $3 billion over two years for one specialty, for one quality measure. It's enormous what you can do. And we've done it with atrial fibrillation. Uh, so our, our sort of sine qua non has been to improve quality, reduce complications that are costly, and look at uh, the amount of money that we spend while doing it. So it really is an identification of best practices, knowledge sharing of those best uh, practices, knowledge transfer, and all of it was done without physician payment. There was no incentives for us to do it. We did it because we thought it was the right thing to do. But I think, I mean, we're running on vapors. We pretty much run on vapors, but we do it. Um, I'm sure that you can create a payment system that would in, enhance regional collaborations and create payment systems that would um, make this work on, in many other specialties. I think the potential savings are enormous. Somebody had mentioned about cutting benefits. That's like a heck no. 
we need to cut waste. We need to reduce complications in the care that we deliver. We need to be more accountable for our financial uh, aspects of care delivery. We don't need to cut benefits. We need to maintain benefits. So I think one of the most innovative, and I'll close with this, Mark, because I know you want to get on, uh, things that we have seen now is the development of a heart team. It's the heart team between cardiologists and us, and, it, and it's revolving around coronary artery disease, and it's around, revolving around aortic stenosis, particularly in light of the transcatheter aortic valve replacement, which is, you know, the traditional way is opening your chest and replacing your aortic valve. There is now a technology where you can do it through the groin. And that has um, moved into uh, a series of patients which are much older, much sicker, high risk, but who, who probably have life expectancies of 50 percent in a year. Uh, and w with that, your life expectancy can be increased by three years or four years. It's, it's fairly good or even more. But we wanted to make sure that it was done appropriately. And so we developed heart teams. And so every patient is seen by a cardiologist, two cardiac surgeons, an anesthesiologist, and a, a care coordinator. Simultaneously, all the risks and benefits are proposed to the patient. Their choices are given, either medical therapy or transcatheter valve or open aortic valve. Uh, it, has been, uh, revol it has revolutionized the way we deliver care. Uh, in our institution, and I'm sure Jim could cite hundreds of other institutions that are doing this, and we're now doing it for coronary artery disease because we have this very strong tension about are we doing too much stenting, are we doing too much coronary artery bypass grafting, when is enough, and when is that too much? And so we're creating the heart team concept because what we want to do is create appropriateness of care because the most expensive care is the unnecessary inappropriate care, right? I mean, we could squeeze 20 percent out of our uh, appropriate operations, but if we do an inappropriate operation, that's 100 percent waste. So in closing, when you design a system, remember one size won't fit all. You're going to have to think about rural versus metropolitan, acad academic versus non-academic, big versus small, but you'll have to create a, at least a core of payment reform that's going to promote uh, clinical, financial, clinical and financial accountability uh, for all uh, physicians in the country. Um, thanks very much, Dr. Rich, and uh, I would like to open this up now to any comments from uh, the, the audience. Uh, I've got to follow up if there, uh, if there are not any other immediate questions. Um, okay, so Dr. Rich ended up uh, in uh, concluding talking about the importance of coordination, some of the gains from this, uh, the, the heart team approach around uh, kind of more advanced uh, coronary artery disease treatment, aortic stenosis treatment. Um, uh, Dr. Barb, you also mentioned the need for more support for care coordination uh, on the, the primary care side. I wonder if we could take the example that Dr. Rich was just talking about and extend it back to uh, primary care towards the, the earlier workup of patients with uh, uh, coronary artery disease, towards uh, how to work effectively on, on heart failure between primary care and specialists. Uh, I, I take it from your comments that you see opportunities there, and I'd like to link that back to what uh, payment reform can do to help those opportunities along. Really appreciate the opportunity to correct an omission in my earlier comments. I have to tell you as a primary care physician, the partnership and the collaboration with my specialty colleagues is absolutely invaluable, irreplaceable, can't be done effectively without this. And in our instance in the CHF readmission rate project, uh, it was a cardiologist uh, working with some of our primary care leaders that designed the overall program that uh, literally educated. We did sort of lunch and learns with our cardiologists about what to be watching for. Well-trained family docs and internists ought to know that. Never hurts to refresh, never hurts to hear from our specialty colleagues how we do that. Um, we uh, did the same thing in radiology. Our radiology imaging costs are essentially flat. We didn't do that by cutting reimbursement to the hospital or to the doctors. We did it by better use of tests. When you get the right test the first time, it's kind of like a heart case. If you, if you do the right procedure the first time and you don't do procedures that you don't need, that's the most efficient way to approach the care. Um, and, you know, counseling and working with the physicians, making ready access, the cardiologist absolutely just open door. You got a question, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I don't care, call me and ask me. Uh, same thing with the radiologist. Don't know what test to do. Well, I might get that MRI. It's more expensive and better, isn't it? No, ultrasound was the right test for that particular issue, whatever that was, whatever that might be. Um, 
we have not, and I'm embarrassed to say this, extrapolated that to the surgical heart care uh, in, a, in as focused a way as we did to CHF care, uh, but clearly that needs to be done. We can do that with the, with the framework that we have, and um, uh, to give me a little incentive, I've, I've obviously been aware of the Virginia project, but we, we haven't gone that far. Yeah, I, I, one thing it's very easy for a pediatric cardiologist to talk about the, the heart team because we, uh, the surgeon and the, the cardiologist worked so paired together just because it was all these the congenital work that had to be done. I, I want to touch upon something you just heard though. It's the idea of disease management and the infrastructure you need. You said the door was open, you could go in and talk to the cardiologist. Our current system now says you have to call the cardiologist up, order and order a consult, the cardiologist goes down there to see it. An awful lot of what we do, and especially if you're on the care team when you're working together side by side, there's a give and take and there's an informality on the decision making and then the, the, then the documentation by one or the other, but there isn't this money transfer to have it done. And I think that's part of the, what we're kind of talking about is our current system it's actually incentivizes a certain way of doing things that doesn't necessarily have to be done. It's, we can handle an awful lot on the curbside consults, but really because of, we haven't even taught, mentioned tort reform, but I'll say it here, but with these other things that are there, we almost have this structure that we have to follow that, is in, that, that breeds inefficiency. And, and getting rid of that need to, ha and to have the formality of things, but have that informal things and the importance of the, the the practitioner, the advanced practice nurse or the extender to actually do the patient management, call them up. Uh, use the example, Mark will remember the 24-hour uh, the, uh, discharge when that first came up here and, uh, and it was done for, for deliveries, was done in Minnesota. But the day after discharge, there was a home health nurse that went to the household for all those discharges. When the insurance companies started picking up in those days of HMOs, that was, that was ignored. So remember all those other little infrastructure things that we said that puts the quality in there that has to be done, even if it's not right now a billable aspect, it has to be built into whatever system of a bundling that you do. Uh, Jeff, any final thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I think uh, Jim described it well. It's the, the old way of doing things is to test first and think later. We need, we need to think first and then figure out what tests we need to get. Um, we, uh, and there are many unreimbursed activities, for instance, at Centera, because our patient population is old, sometimes older and more frail, we've cl uh, created an outpatient clinic, which is free. There's, it's all financed by the hospital, and we, we tier our patients into high, low, and medium risk for readmission and complications, and we see them back at different frequencies. or we send them home with, with scales to see if they're going into heart failure, they're gaining weight, and we've prevented readmissions. Our readmission rate has gone down drastically. It's completely uh, a free thing, and we do it because, number one, it you know, creates patient safety, but two, uh, the community satisfaction is really great. You send, you send an 81-year-old lady home with her 82-year-old husband after a bypass, you got to think about that they may not make it very well without some added support. And you know, finally, I think you know some of the things we talked about breaking down silos and bundled payments. We've done that. We created a dem I wrote a demonstration in Virginia to do just that. You know, where we had shared savings, we had performance metrics, we had pay for performance. Um, it got scuttled because it violated uh, Stark regulations and civil monetary penalty laws, which uh, got resurrected when I was at CMS as the ACE demo. So it's now in three states. It's bundled payments for coronary artery bypass grafting and other cardiac surgery and orthopedic surgery. So it works. It does work. It worked very well for us for a short period of time in Virginia. And it provided great incentives for us to work together. Uh, I like to, I appreciate these final comments about the importance of coordination and how uh, the, the, the lack of support, unless there are real payment reforms around bundling, around uh, uh, supporting uh, not just primary care medical homes, but supporting the specialist side of uh, working with this is, uh, is very important. And uh, uh, I do want to thank uh, all of you on this panel, our previous panel on uh, cancer care, um, uh, Senator Whitehouse, Representative Schwartz, Dr. Cassidy. Uh, for making this not the usual kind of event on payment reform. Uh, as uh, all of you have heard today and all of you who are joining us on the web, 
uh, have heard today, uh, the, the, the most important path, according to the uh, physician leadership view of, um, uh, of uh, pain reform, is to support better care. Uh, as uh, Dr. Cassidy emphasized, this is about uh, improving care delivery, improving that human relationship between patients and doctors. And you've heard uh, a lot of uh, a pretty clear agreement, I think, on some key elements for doing that, including uh, better support for the data uh, infrastructure, for the uh, decision making uh, to, to get behind uh, these efforts to Im improve care, uh, better support for uh, quality measures and cost measures to, to show the impact uh, of these reforms and uh, keep uh, not only patient confidence up, but, all, uh, but very importantly, uh, to show what is really working, uh, information that uh, physicians very much want uh, in their efforts to improve uh, care for patients, and then thinking about payment alignment uh, through bundling or other steps uh, beyond that. But it really starts with improving patient care, and uh, the, uh, the, the savings that come out of this are, are a consequence of focusing on quality of care and getting the care right first. Uh, unfortunately, as you heard today, uh, under current fee-for-service payments uh, in Medicare, especially as these have been squeezed down, as Dr. Rich said, uh, these kinds of new initiatives are often running on vapors. Uh, they're, they're done uh, in spite of uh, and, and not because of uh, the support from the payment systems. And uh, it's not enough just to have an isolated uh, one-off pilot or demonstration program here or there. I think what you've heard from uh, everyone here is that it's time for a systematic approach uh, with flexibility, with accommodating rural areas, small providers, providers in different kinds of circumstances uh, to get us from here to there uh, in the years ahead uh, as part of, um, as really maybe the most important element of uh, Medicare physician payment reform. Uh, so obviously there is much more to come on this uh, with the support from the Merkin Foundation. We expect to build on events like this one and our continuing collaborations with physician leaders around the country uh, on uh, uh, not only uh, what needs to be done conceptually, but working out all of those, uh, as Dr. McGinty said, the nitty gritty details uh, of getting from here to there uh, in terms of uh, uh, specific payment reforms and quality measures and their implementation and the like. So uh, much more to come, uh, but uh, we do want to leave you on, a, on an optimistic note. We've covered some very serious conditions that are having a huge impact on the public health of this country. Um, uh, not only, as uh, Dr. Rich said, are we talking about half of Medicare expenditures, not just the, uh, the small part of uh, a physician payment that uh, uh, is, a, is a small component of that. Uh, we're talking about some of the leading causes of death uh, and disability and uh, loss in this country. Uh, so there's a whole lot at stake with this effort. And again, thank you all for uh, taking a, 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 a clinical approach to this problem. And uh, we hope that it's going to have, and we expect that it's going to have a big impact on uh, health care reform from here. Uh, thanks again for joining us, and we'll look forward to, forward to working with you on fu future activities with our Merkin Leadership Initiative uh, on uh, clinical leadership and health care reform. Thank you very much. And actually, before everybody leaves, I, I left the most important note. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Kavita Patel, Judy Tobin, Sarah Banchik, and uh, Beth Rafferty, and the rest of the Brookings staff for putting this together. Thank you all very much.